You know, I think that if you're making videos where you're saying you're debunking flat earth, you shouldn't be scared to be challenged. So nevertheless, just to get through this video, what I want to say before we get started is disagreements are not bad. We're really seeking the truth. As men, we should be able to disagree and have a respectful debate. But I knew he wasn't going to answer my invitation, so that's why I'm making this video and I'm going to debunk each one of his points that he made in a video and prove to you that flat earth is real and it's nothing I believe, it's something I know. So with that being said, we're gonna move on and get clarity, everybody. We're gonna learn from this situation. So shout out to Seti. I know you're not man enough to uh, face somebody with logic and truth because when all you have is pseudoscience, it uh, never stand up against logic and truth. So something we really, really need to keep in our mind that's very important before we get into any of this. If you don't understand this, nothing gonna make sense to you. Understand that the flat earth floating disc that said it debunked, that's a controlled opposition model that was created by a government group called the Flat Earth Society. You see, the government knew that one day a lot of people would start waking up to Flat Earth Truth. So they already had a group set up called a Flat Earth Society that's going to mislead people when they come into Flat Earth. So the first thing most people do when they learn about Flat Earth is they go to the Flat Earth Society and they learn Flat Earth cosmology from deceivers. The Flat Earth Society's model was created by the same people who given us the globe and they created that model to stray people away from the flat earth truth. So please keep that in mind that the model said it debunked, he didn't debunk flat earth. I'm gonna be showing you the real flat earth model here today that said he did not show you. Why? Because if said he was to show you this model, it would reveal something about said that'll make you scratch your head and say, hmm, See, the real flat earth model that Brother Sanchez teach and embrace is the sky god is Nook and the earth god Gale that's carved in the walls of Kemet that our ancestors left us. You cannot find a solar system or a globe in Kemet. So with that being said, you got to keep in mind why did Seti go on his platform and go against flat earth using sciences and models that NASA give us instead of dealing with the real flat earth cosmology, how our ancestors taught about it. It can be proven, whereas the globe and all of its theories can't be proven. And I'm gonna be debunking them, all of them here today. Understand that that's hypocritical of Seti to say that he loved Egypt so much, but to do a video on flat earth cosmology and not bring up Nut and Gab, so since he didn't bring it up, I'm going to bring up Nook and Gale because when you go to my channel, that's the first thing you see. You see Nook and Gale. You see our ancestors' cosmology. So today I'm going to blow you away as I take my belt from around my waist and put it on Seti's ass. So slide number one from Sarah Suit and Seti. He says that the fact that you can circumnavigate the planet proves that the earth is not a flat surface with edges. Now, let me just say that no one has never circumnavigated this CGI picture that he's showing. Keep in mind that the picture he's using here is a CGI image and is not real. And no one has never circumnavigated a globe. So what happens What's the illusion? What's the deception? Well, let me explain. If you're looking at the diagram in front of you, this is what happens on our flat earth. Now, just stay with me. I'm going to take this even deeper, and I'm going to show you why no one has never circumnavigated a globe and why literally it's impossible, the whole idea of a globe and selling a globe when you understand the properties of water which I'm going to explain here shortly. But I just want you to lock this in your mind because most of you are not familiar with the real flat earth cosmology. 
Now, this is a circular disc, but this is not floating in a universe. Us flat earthers don't believe that this little disc is floating in the universe. This is just a little diagram, okay? That ice ring you see stretches on and on and on, and there's even lands beyond it, more lands that they're hiding. And that's why they created the UN Treaty and the Antarctic Treaty so that we can't go explore those lands. But we will get into that here in the future. You got to understand that why the need for a treaty. Another thing about circumnavigation is just what the pictures say. If I walk outside my front door and I walk my dogs around the block and end up in my front yard, does that mean I went over a curve to get back home? Selling in a circle don't mean you went over a ball of water to get to your destination. Water does not bend. One of the immaculate properties of water is the fact that water is balanced. No matter what you put water in, it will always find a flat level. Its surface will always maintain its flat level. This is where we get the term sea level from. So it don't take a genius to understand basic physics of water that it can never flow uphill as it would have to do on a globe. At some point in the oceans, that water would have to bend and flow uphill and downhill opposite ways of each other. And that's against the properties of water, people. There's no way possible you can demonstrate how water can bend. Now, a lot of people say raindrops is an example of water bending. Well, that doesn't prove nothing but the shape that anything will take as it's falling through a medium, meaning air would be the medium. Right now, if you swing your hand real fast across your face, you can move the air particles around and actually feel them. You will feel the wind. So that air is all around you. And when a raindrop is falling, it's traveling through a medium. And it's not a perfect sphere. It's a glob of water. It's a driplet. It's, if anything, it's a pear. But when that droplet hits the surface and these droplets collect themselves and they stabilize themselves into a puddle, the surface of that puddle will always be flat no matter if you're in an ocean, a little pond. Water will never bend. It will never flow uphill. Therefore, it's impossible to circumnavigate a globe. We are actually going around in circles on a flat plane earth. Airplanes are flying even with the horizon and on a globe. The pilot will have to constantly nose dive to keep from flying out into space and off of the globe. Ships are not vanishing over a curve when you're at the beach. If you get a simple telescope, you can bring them back into view. That would not be possible on a globe because you wouldn't be able to see the ship. It'll be hidden behind a huge ball of curvature, a huge ball of water. A ship is not going over a curve when it's vanishing at the horizon. It's leaving your field of view. Everything converges at the horizon, and it's all based on perception. Again, if the Earth was a globe that was 24,000 miles in circumference across, every six miles we should be able to detect curvature. That has not happened. If that was the case, the Chicago skyline would not be visible. It should be hidden behind a ball of curvature. Lighthouses wouldn't even be possible. Where a ship can see a lighthouse, ships start seeing lighthouses way before they get to six miles, people. And that shouldn't be possible on a globe. I'm sure that ships start seeing lighthouses as far back as 10 miles and probably even way, way more farther than that. If the weather permits and the atmosphere is clear, that lighthouse will have to be hidden behind curvature if the earth were a globe. So ships prove that the earth is a plane and no, they're not going over a ball of water that's flowing uphill. They're just going in circles, ending up right where they started. Very, very simple, just like you walking around a block. Don't be deceived by the theories. Water does not flow uphill. It's time that we start trusting our senses. So before we move on, we also want to plug in the fact that if ships are going over the horizon when you're looking out ahead of you at the beach, then why aren't the ships that's sailing east and west, left and right, 
going over the horizon. If we're seeing curvature when we're at the beach as ships vanish over the horizon in front of us, then we should be able to detect that same equal amount of curvature to the left and right or east and west on the horizon at the beach. Why is it that the ships only vanish in front of us on the horizon and not east and west? We should see ships coming in from the left and right as they climb up the curve into our field of view. And the horizon at the beach should be bending as we look left and right. If ships are vanishing from the curve directly in front of us. So don't let your human limitations deceive you. You can't see for thousands and thousands of miles. So just because a ship left your field of view and melted into the horizon doesn't mean that it went over a curve. So again, raindrops doesn't prove water bending either because when skydivers drop from a helicopter, you can look at their mouth as the wind enters their mouth. It makes their cheeks bubble up and get all big as they try to talk. The wind is rushing into their mouth, blowing their cheeks up. And you can look at their uniform blowing upward as they fall down. The wind is blowing their strings and everything upward. This is why the parachute works, people. It catches the wind as it falls downward. And it's able to balance itself out and come to a nice little safe fall as it catches that wind all the way down. That parachute is making a bulge because it's filling itself up with air. But in a raindrop's case, the air is shaping the raindrop as it falls downward. And we can't say that raindrops are spherical because no two raindrops are the same. No two raindrops are the same. Every raindrop is unique. So we really got to start thinking about what we say and understand that the whole idea of circumnavigation is impossible because water does not flow uphill and it does not bend and that sailors are just going in circles on a flat plane and ending up right where they started at. We've been deceived with this theoretical curvature. So slide number two from Sarah Sutton Seti. He says that the earth is basically round because of the semicircle shadow of the earth on the moon. So, yeah, he basically is reteaching you NASA's Western cosmology. We all grew up learning that the earth's shadow is what causes the moon phases. I don't know why Sarah Sutton said he think he need to reteach us that like we didn't know about the globe coming up in school. You don't think flat earthers did that much research? Now, let me go ahead and debunk this right now real quick. How can I prove that the Earth's shadow is not causing the moon phases? Answer this question, Sarah Sutton said it. If Earth's shadow caused the moon phase, explain a half moon. Everyone know if I hold a basketball up in front of a wall, I'm not going to get a star. If I hold my hand up in front of the lamp, my shadow is not going to be my head. The shadow is going to reveal exactly that which is being blocked by the light, revealing the true dimensions of that object. This is why he's trying to use that example by saying that the earth is circular because of this circular shadow. Makes perfect sense, right? But not when you think about the half moon. Impossible for a circular earth to ever cause a half moon. So if you think about what the ancestors said about the moon, they said that it's not even physical. You can't even land on it. Now y'all understand why the moon missions were fake. You can't land on the moon. It's holographic. How can I prove it? Because you can see stars clean through the moon if you got a good telescope. People have observed stars through the moon with their telescope. They've zoomed in on stars that's supposed to be blocked by a solid moon. But what we're finding out is the moon is its own light source. And it is indeed holographic, just like the ancestors say. How can I prove it? Just for the simple fact, during the daytime, you can see the blue sky through the moon. And at nighttime, you can see the black sky through the moon. Shows that the moon is translucent. It has translucent-like properties. It's holographic. 
But these are observations we don't make because we're trapped in the synthetic science, the false science, the theoretical science, where you drop microphones and you accept the beliefs of men just because they say they're scientists. Okay? The ancestors didn't have none of the fancy equipment they have, and they understood more about this reality than most of you. So when you go back and explore what the ancestors said and do real honest research, you unlock these mysteries that I'm doing for you today. And I'm answering these questions that the brother asked. So no matter what you say to me, it's impossible for a circular earth to cause a half moon under no situation. How can you explain that to me? Put your hands in front of any light. We used to do it when we was little. We would make puppet figures based on the fact that the shadow's gonna reveal that object. So if you use an example that this shadow is circular because of the earth is circular, you would really have to explain to us all how can a circular earth make a perfect horizontal line? impossible point number two debunked let's move forward so the moon is its own light source there have been experiments done to prove that moonlight is colder than sunlight and it's a simple experiment you take a thermometer and you actually take the temperature of moon shadow at nighttime if you can go beneath the moonlight and find a shaded area and take the temperature of that shaded area, you will notice that when you take the temperature of the moonlight and point your thermometer directly at the moonlight, you will realize that the shaded area is actually warmer than the moonlight. So yes, you need to really think about that, people. Moonlight is cold, the fact that at nighttime, if you find a shaded area, that shaded area that's not being hit by moonlight is going to be warmer than moonlight. So the light of the moon, it's cold, it's silver. The light of the sun, it's warm and it's red, orange, reddish orange. So these are two dynamic light sources that's equal to each other like yin and yang, just like our ancestors said. And I can get into that deeper in future videos, but I want to make this short and deal with just his particular points and debunk them one by one without straying too far into teaching a whole flat earth lecture. One more point I want to make is that the moon can't be getting its light because it's reflecting the light of the sun. Because if you think of a full moon, it's very, very bright. And you got to understand that this is really what light looks like when it's being reflected on a sphere. This is not what we see when we look at the moon. It's holographic, it's dynamic. Sometimes the moon lights up very bright. Sometimes the moon is a small reddish glow. Sometimes the moon changes its facial features in hours. This has been observed before. So the moon does its phases all by itself. It's a dynamic light show all by itself. It's a lesser light, a night light. So the earth is not a globe. And you can't prove it by saying that the moon phases are caused by the Earth's shadow. And because of this semicircle shadow of the Earth on the moon, that proves Earth is a globe. Well, that means Earth must be a globe and a flat disk then. Because during a half moon, it's perfectly flat vertical. And that's impossible for a sphere to catch that type of shadow. That debunks point number two. Now let's move on. So slide number three from Sara Sut and Seti. How can the earth be flat with mountains, valleys, and oceans, valleys filled with water? Get the heck out of here. Are you serious? Okay, I'm definitely not going to spend too much time with this one. And let's answer this one very simple by doing a quick little experiment in my home. So basically the question Sara Sut and Seti asked was, how can the earth be flat with mountains and canyons and valleys and all of these things on its surface. Well, that's a very, very simple question. Let me help my brother out. You see this table? It's flat, right? Perfectly flat. Now let's introduce some features to this flat table real quick. So now here is our perfectly flat table. 
But now what we have on top is a couple of features, a few elevations upon this surface. Question people, is it still a flat surface? According to SETI, this is no longer a flat table now that I've introduced features upon its surface. <laughs> so this fourth slide is pretty easy. I pretty much just gave the example in the kitchen and uh, that example pretty much debunks this slide as well. But I can deal with this one real briefly for you. So he gives the definition of flat, but the definition he gives according to his own selection proves flat earth according to him if you want to use definitions because if you look at a synonym for flat, you have the word horizontal. Now, what you guys got to understand is this. Said he don't deal too much with etymology, but it's very simple to understand that when we say horizon, that horizon is the root word of horizontal, and that if the earth was a curve, then why are we calling it a horizon? Wouldn't it be a curvizon? A line that's horizontal never, ever curves. The moment it starts to bend and curve, and form a sphere or a circle, it's no longer a horizontal line, no matter how you want to perceive it. Now, the fact that we have a horizon and not a curvizon, according to this definition, you actually proven flat earth, my friend. But to drive it home even more, he looked up the definition of flat, smooth and even, without marked lumps or indentations. Now check this out, right? Think of the example I use with the flat table. Its surface is flat, no matter if a mountain is standing upon it. Okay, if I got a flat coffee table and I sit my coffee cup down on that coffee table, that table is still flat, smooth, and even. Now my coffee cup is not flat, it's round, it's got a cup shape but it's sitting upon a flat surface, the same as a mountain, the same as a tree, the same as you and me. So according to said his logic, a basketball court is flat, but the moment humans get on it and start standing upon it, it's no longer flat no more because you just added features upon its surface. So the point here is a flat surface is a flat surface no matter what sits upon it. So when we say the earth is flat, we're not saying it doesn't have features upon its surface. And as we move on and get deeper into the flat earth ancient cosmology of our ancestors, I will explain to you how all of these dimensions are included in flat earth cosmology as opposed to the globe. It only has the 3D aspect. Flat earth cosmology is one cosmic egg that you are enclosed in. Nothing in nature lives on the surface of the egg. All of the life is enclosed inside of the egg, as above, so below. When you look at Nut and Gale, you can see this concept. So when you think of the dimensions, the fact that the first dimension would be the point of singularity, the conception of the creation itself, and then the canvas, which the artist paint the picture upon, would be the horizon or the earth plane. Upon this two-dimensional horizon, three-dimensional objects can exist. It's a building step process through the dimensions. Us three-dimensional beings live upon a two-dimensional surface. Think of a canvas, an artist that's drawing three-dimensional art upon a two-dimensional surface. Our reality is very beautiful. It's being hidden by a false cosmology. That cosmology is what I'm trying to free my brother Seti from. So understand that when you say planet, you're saying plain, net. Net is nut. Plain is gab. We're on a plain enclosed in a net or a nut. Now we have to move on to the next point because point number four has been debunked. So slide number five from Sarah Sudan City. He pulls up these fake CGI phony ass pics that the government give us to deceive us with 
and take their word, believe them that this is really real. And he put that up and say, does this look like the earth is flat? Said it, please don't tell me you really believe that those pictures are real. So I just demonstrated to y'all about the curvature and the flat surface. But just to drive it home, deal with this slide here. Again, these pictures are fake. And if you don't believe me, it's a problem. The very fact that you can either believe me or not. And that we're dealing with belief and we're supposed to be dealing with facts and science. The belief aspect is inescapable in this case because when I look at this evidence he presented and who it come from, well, yeah, I don't believe it. You know, you can't force me to believe it. You can prove facts like I'm doing. For example, he's showing you fake pictures right now that you can either believe or not believe. Now, I'm going to show you some real pictures from amateur balloons of regular people that don't work with the government who just launched up balloons with cameras on them. And this one here is from the height of 110,000 feet. We see a horizon that meets us at eye level, and it's perfectly flat. From this height, you can't even notice the features in the mountains upon the earth. You can only perceive it as a plain. Again, your eyes are not godlike, for lack of better words. Your eyes has limitations. From 110,000 feet, if you think you can look down above a mountain and really make out all of the features, you got to be kidding me. From that high up, we would see a perfectly flat horizon that's meeting us at eye level if the earth is an extended or infinite plane. That's exactly what we see. Okay, when we rise up, if we were on a globe, the horizon would fall away from us the higher we go. And we would start to begin to see that curvature start taking form as we leave the ground and rise up. The more we rise, we would see that curvature starting to form in our peripheral until eventually we would get so far back, we would just see the earth as a little ball. But from 110,000 feet, it's a straight horizontal plane, just like our ancestors said. Who do I trust, the ancestors and these people with the amateur balloons, or do I trust NASA and their fake pictures? I think I'll go with the ancestors and the regular people. Besides, NASA makes $50 million a day. They have a reason to lie and a motive, but regular people don't because we don't want to be getting tax no doggone $50 million a day for something as fake as this that you can debunk in one hour and it's one of their most lucrative budgets and you wonder why the flat earth truth is so important let's start with 50 million dollars a day so yeah i don't believe nasa and the crooks who's taking that much money from us every day and giving us these ugly looking pictures that this boy using to support his facts with you rather believe what these imposters give you. And I'm showing you what regular people have recorded with their cameras at 110,000 feet. We should see a little ball and we see a flat plane meeting us at eye level as we rise. Impossible on a globe. So this slide here is debunked. And it's up to you if you want to trust them pictures that NASA give you or go with the amateur balloons that clearly shows a flat plane. If you think they got a real picture of Earth, you got to be fooling yourself. Look at the picture in front of you. If none of these pictures are consistent and we all see that they're CGI and Photoshop, the NASA even admitted to it. Why do you think the one he's using there is real? So get real. Flat Earthers aren't stupid. We people who've done a lot of research and the more you know, the crazier you sound. But I have no problem with that long as I got the truth. This is supposed to be a satellite image, but we know satellites don't exist. Satellites are just cell towers. And to prove my point, when you leave out of heavily populated areas, you can barely get a signal. If satellites existed, no matter where you go on the globe, if the Earth was surrounded by all of these satellites, you would have hell of a good signal. The fact that as soon as you leave the city, you start breaking up, show you that your phone is getting its signal from cell towers that's in heavily populated cities. And the fact that the dishes on these houses are not pointed up, but out toward the nearest cell tower proves my point. 
So if satellites don't exist, what is this picture? More NASA deception. So again, you choose the pics from real people who trying to disprove our government and reveal the fact that we're being deceived. Well, you're going to take the images of proven liars to prove your point like the general. Get real, people. Enough time spent on this one. It's clearly debunked. Now let's move on. So point six by SETI already went over. How can the earth be flat with mountains and etc.? We already drove that home. Let's move on. Point seven, mountains, highs and valley lows prove vertical dimensions and etc. This is basically dealing with the same point that I already previously debunked. So we're going to move right on to slide number eight. And now it's pretty much the same concept of the earth is not flat because of the surface features. And he's missing the whole concept of how we perceive the horizon. In building on what I said previously with the table experiment, to get you to see exactly how we perceive the horizon, everyone's overall perception of it is horizontal. No one has never perceived it curve other than CGI deception, fish eye lens, and fakery. In nature, that horizon is always horizontal no matter where you go, no matter how high you rise. So this pretty much is the same situation we find ourselves in where he's using the government's pictures and deception to prove his point. If I accept this picture as belief, then yeah, I will have to argue it, but I can look at it right now and tell you it's fake. You're not going to tell me they've mapped out the bottom of the ocean and you see in this picture they have the bottom of the ocean curved. Whatever kind of image this is, from this view, if we were at the bottom of the ocean, we wouldn't see any curvature at the bottom of the ocean, even if the earth was a globe you would not see curvature at the bottom of the ocean, people. So just the fact that you see curvature in this picture makes it a bunch of baloney. Again, you either believe this picture or not. You either trust that they map the ocean floor and that they're giving you a correct picture or not. But I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because I've already proved that a flat surface can have features upon it and still be flat. So let me move right on along to the next slide that was presented by your general. <laughs> slide number nine, just a lovely picture of the general. Shout out to my brother, but the joke's on you, my friend. So slide number 10, this one is going to be very easy to debunk. You know why? I don't have to argue this one. <laughs> you know why? I don't even accept this model. Why do most of the time they show you a two-dimensional flat surface, flat earth? Good question, Seti. I'm with you on that one, my brother, because this model that you're debunking, again, it was created by the government. In other words, y'all, this little laughable model that's so easy to debunk, it's laughable that he really think millions of flat earthers believe in this. He really think pilots who are flat earthers, professors who are flat earthers, because I hope you don't think it's just a few YouTubers. You guys are funny. This is a real awakening. Get real. We're finding out we've been deceived, and you can prove the deception in just an hour. You can prove at least enough of it to make you say, hmm, something is going on. All right, so listen. Understand that the same people who created the globe created this flat little disc still floating around in their space with gravity. Remember, in the real, true, flat Earth cosmology of our ancient ancestors, there is no gravity, it's only density. they still got this disk inside of a Big Bang-inspired cosmology. This void, this vacuum, this free-for-all, where all of these chaotic bodies are floating around recklessly, started from a Big Bang, a mishap. Is not by intelligent design. It wasn't thought out. It was just a random explosion and just so happened things meshed together for life to be here. So flat earthers go against that cosmology, all of it. And the fact that you put a flat disk in the same Helios cosmos, that's not a true representation of what flat earthers teach. So this is actually deception on SETI's behalf because he's misrepresenting 
what Flat Earth is teaching. He's giving you the deception that the government put out there. So he's auguring one of their models, which is the globe, with another stupid model that they put out there for anybody who thought they were smart enough to figure out the Earth was flat. They knew the first thing you would go to was the Flat Earth Society, which is a government-funded opposition movement to mislead those who actually wake up to the truth. So when people find out the earth is flat and they go there and they start believing in this dumb disc and they don't go back to the ancestors and go to Nut and Gelb and all of the ancestors, they fall for the deception number two. The government is smarter than you think. They know we're going to smarten up and they got things in place for that. So this little disc that everyone keep debunking, Minister Inky did it too. I just want y'all to realize you don't debunk Flat Earth when you debunk the Flat Earth Society's deceptive model. Real Flat Earthers do not accept this model. So you got to debunk Nut and Gab, which again explains why SETI embraces Kemet. And he's so in love with Egypt, but he did a four-hour lecture, and I don't think he brought up Nut and Gab. Now, I admit I wasn't able to watch it all. I picked through the thing. Maybe I missed the parts where he brought up Nut and Gab or mentioned it. You guys can fill me in. But if you bring up Nut and Gab, why would you also bring up this government deception of a disc floating in space? When you, if you bring up Nut and Gab, understand that that would be what us flat earthers are teaching about. You would know that if you did a little research on flat earth, which apparently he did not. He went for the deception and fell right into the flat earth society control opposition trap. So again, I don't have to argue on this disc behalf. I'm going to laugh at it with you, man. Salute to you on that because I think it's funny too. I don't believe in that. I know that we're on a flat plane and that the cosmology we have of Nut and Gab and others like it is the correct cosmology. We can prove it with facts like I'm doing now. So I don't accept that model, and we're going to move on. You can talk to the Flat Earth Society about that dumb model. But let Brother Sanchez go and prove to you that you're not on a globe and that the ground you're walking on is a flat plane. Let me continue to do that. <laughs> Slides number 9 and 10 I will be dealing with together. So number 9 and 10, he answers his previous question for himself. But allow me to answer it and I'll use his demonstrations. Again, you are on a plane enclosed in a celestial sphere. So in other words, you have the linear aspect and the curve aspect. Think of a bow and arrow. That bow and arrow has power based on those dualities, the feminine and the masculine, like a battery, positive and negative. Bring them together, you get power. You get a stiff linear stick and an arched wiggly string or whatever have you a rubber band and you able to make a bow and arrow shoot an arrow and pour energy right around you based on you tapping into as above so below these cosmological concepts so when you see the goddesses with the arch bow you're just looking at gab and nut you have the linear and the curve again, yin and yang, whereas when you deal with the globe, you only have the curve. What I'm saying is this, balance is in flat earth, and we can prove flat earth when we observe our reality, but what happens is SETI comes along, and he gives you a little cartoon drawing that the enemy give us, and you end up with this little demonstration of a core that they never proved or found. The deepest hole that was ever drilled in the ground was over eight miles. And guess what, guys? There was no lava, no magma. None of the stuff they have is fact. It's all theory. The fact that you have to believe in it just like the Bible. And with science, you know, you prove things with the scientific method. You don't believe science. Science is not a noun. It's a verb. The fact that he's showing you pictures that he believe in, I might not believe in it. It's no different than a Muslim showing you pictures of Allah that they believe in and arguing the theology behind it. They're showing you cosmological theories of this synthetic science they give us in the Western world. You really think they're giving us the truth? Your science is a religion. That's why you believe in it. Real science, you know. You wouldn't be having this argument if it was based upon facts. 
All you got to do is go outside on a hot day and stick your finger down into the dirt and feel how cool it is beneath the soil. It's cool under the ground. When you pick a worm up, when you dig a worm out of the ground, that worm is cold because it's been up under the ground in the soil. And the sun can be beaming down on the surface of the ground. But the minute you stick your hand in that dirt, you start feeling the coolness under the ground. So why is NASA showing us that under the ground, the further we dig, the hotter it gets and it turns into molten lava? Doesn't add up. I grew up in a town where there was a coal mine that went thousands of feet into the ground. And if you stand in front of it, it's colder than the air conditioner. If you throw a rock down into it, bats will fly out of the thing. And we would go up there and my grandma would say, y'all be careful. But I knew then that when you go into the ground, it's very cold in the ground, okay? It don't warm up. So it's the totally opposite of this burning core concept. And if you think about the whole idea, I'm going to get off subject for a minute. We say that Africa is mounted to the core of the earth. But the core is molten lava. You can't really anchor anything to lava. I mean, think of a ship anchor. It can anchor to the bottom of the ocean floor when it catch on to the solid ground that's down there. But think of that ship anchor trying to anchor itself in molten lava. It just can't happen. So nothing can be anchored to molten lava. So that debunks itself. We got to start really investigating the things that we say. If you were honest, you would do that unless you're just a person that want to keep spewing misinformation because you never want to be wrong. I don't mind you mocking me for believing in this flat earth cosmology. I'm sorry I said I believe in it. I don't believe in it. I know it. I know the earth is flat. My ancestors did as well, and they was mocked in the past just like I am today. So I'm going to move right on along and give Seti some more work. And I'm going to keep my cool and we're going to keep the atmosphere professional and scientific and show this guy what real science is, what real investigation is. Don't show me the enemy's model and make his arguing points. Anybody can do that. My children can come in here and do that. Why don't you investigate these deceivers instead of be so quick to go against what your ancestors taught and argue for the enemy? But you banging on the beast, though. Yet you pulling up all his science and his information. Where they do that at? Let's move on. Just like religious beliefs is sold to you by the pastor in fake science, their science beliefs is sold to you by pastors like Neil deGrasse Tyson and the rest of them. They're all pastors selling you another religion, dropping microphones and putting on a show, acting like fools and clowns instead of being real scientists and answering these questions that I'm putting in this video that he clearly can't. So real quick, just to explain gravity it don't exist. It's just a theory. What exists is density. Just the fact that a butterfly can break the law of gravity proves it sure hell is a weak law. You mean to tell me it can hold all of the water of the ocean to this globe, but a firefly can break this law? Come on now, put helium in a balloon and it'll go upward. Come on now, it's called density and this is how it works. You're inside of a medium, all around you is air, oxygen particles, air particles, for lack of better words, and uh, no different than a fish surrounded in, in a medium called water. So what happens in this medium, anything that is lighter than the air particles or oxygen particles around us will rise and anything that's heavier than those particles will sink based on its own density. Same thing with an airplane. It breaks the law of gravity. It's all about density. Think of a ship on the ocean. Helium is a gas that's lighter than oxygen. So when you put helium into a balloon, the balloon rises because the helium is lighter than the oxygen. This is the reason why ships float. This is the reason why if you go to the ocean and drop a tiny pebble into the ocean, it'll sink to the bottom. But yet a heavy cruise ship that's the size of a street block or even bigger, Navy carriers the size of cities floating. Think about that. 
Think of a Navy carrier the size of small cities floating on the ocean, but yet if you drop a pebble into the water, it'll sink to the bottom. What's making that ship float? Because there's something in that ship called oxygen, air, and those air particles are lighter than the water particles. Therefore, they could never sink in the water. You know what happened when air enters water? It instantly rises, and I'll prove it to you. Have you ever been at the bottom of a swimming pool and you open up your mouth and try to talk? What happens to the air that exits your mouth? It instantly shoots up to the surface. Air would always shoots up to the surface, and when it comes out of the surface of the water, it'll burst back into the atmosphere and free itself back to its other air particles because they don't belong in the water and its particles are lighter than those particles that make up water. Therefore, the bubbles rise. Therefore, the helium balloon rises. Gravity is just a theory. Density is the truth. So slide number 13 presented by SETI, basically the same exact thing I just went over. I don't have to argue for this model that he's debating against because I don't accept it. I teach what our ancestors taught, Nut and Gab. He's teaching you to glow what Copernicus gave our ancestors. You see, when the slaves were made slaves, not only was they given the Bible, they was given the globe. But that's a whole nother video. And that can take hours going into, but it's really simple. The people who conquered you told you the opposite. They told you your ancestors were dummies who thought the earth was flat and Columbus discovered that the earth was a globe by making it to Americas. Basically, they said that the earth was a globe even before Columbus. They had early deceivers. The whole globe earth is synonymous with sun worship and a new world all agenda. It was all necessary. When you think of the globe deception, and you look around at all of the religions who support the globe, you can see how it's all the same thing. It's the same God. Even if you say you so conscious, you don't accept no religions. Even if you accept the globe model, it's still sun worship. It's still a cosmology that originated from their God. Who is their God? The atheistic God that don't exist out of pure nothingness, a mishap cosmos with no order, and a bunch of objects that float around without any foundations. That's something to think about. So again, I don't have to debate this model that was presented by the same deceivers to throw us off. We going back to the true cosmology of flat earth. Newton Gale, what he didn't go to, but he so-called got love for the ancestors. Shaking my head. We're going to move right on along. So slide number 14 presented by Sarah Sutton Seti. It's pretty much the same thing. I don't have to argue this model because uh, it's not the model that I teach. This is the controlled opposition model that they put out there to mislead the real flat earth truth of our ancestors. But what I will say about this model, if you want the real truth about our cosmology, stay tuned for future videos I have coming on Antarctica and beyond the ice ring because the model I teach does have us enclosed in the ice wall but there are openings in that ice wall that lead to new worlds. When Columbus went around selling to discover new worlds that's exactly what it meant new worlds not new continents. They was careful to use their wording but again that's a whole nother presentation I already have it made you just gotta wait on me to upload it I had to take my time to deal with this one, so I'm not going to teach it twice. Until then, look it up on YouTube. Plenty of my flat earth friends have done excellent work with that. But anyway, just to give you a sneak peek beyond the ice wall are more continents, more land. We don't know. It may go on forever full of continents. See, this is how detrimental the globe is. And I'm showing you how easy it is to debunk the globe. And you got to ask yourself, why they have a treaty that prevents us from exploring the North Pole and the Antarctic Ring? Why is it called an Arctic Circle? In the diaries of, I believe, Captain Cook, maybe that's where they get the cartoon Captain Hook from. And maybe I'm pronouncing his captain's name wrong. But anyway, 
There's been plenty captains and plenty naval expeditions that have proven the ice wall, and we actually have pictures of it. Antarctica is not a continent. It's a ring. And there is more to explore beyond it. And I have so much proof to support that. Okay, that's a fact. So again, I don't have to debate this model. It's controlled opposition. But stay tuned if you want to understand how the globe is such a matrix because it hides land. It balls up the true map of the earth and hides potential lands. But hey, we talk about cities like Atlantis and things of that nature. When you look at these ancient maps that they've hid from us, they resemble Atlantis. So I say Earth is Atlantis. These ideas didn't just come from their imagination. They get them from these old maps that they thought would never resurface. But I go into this in so many videos, I can't do it now. Basically, if there are other lands with other peoples, with these treaties and these governments in power, you better believe they're believing in globes too. And all of us don't know about each other because we spin in globes being deceived. There may be lands that go on and on. Do you know how lucrative this lie would be and how they would have to hide this lie to control everybody from trying to explore and just go on and start new lives out of this hellish ass slave system? We could even be a slave race being exploited to another colony that Columbus went to start after he established Americas and colonized the Indians, because the Indians here, the natives, I must say, because I don't want to say Indians, but the natives here were flat earthers. Future generations today, we believe in the globe, but maybe they had a connection to some of these lands beyond the ring that none of us know about today. And this gets real deep, but I can't go into that. But it goes into the histories of the space races and how they basically became the lords of the rings. If you look at this cosmology, because you can't go and explore beyond the ring. All of the nations of the world have a section that they guard. You need to think about that. They go to war every day. But the only thing they can work together on is to keep you away from discovering what's beyond this ring and if you ask me they have so much to hide and the ancestors did not so i truly believe there are lands beyond the ring and that this map is real based on all of the evidence which you will see in my presentation on lands beyond antarctica and the future videos i have coming i just had to bring that up to show y'all more reasons besides the monetary ones why giving us the globe was important because it hides potential lands. They telling you that the world is so small you can travel around it multiple times in your lifetime. Don't make sense. Sound like a limited creator to me that stuck us to a ball in a void of chaotic darkness with things clashing around. Like I said, we really got to investigate their science and put it to the test against our ancestors' truth. Because all of their science is based on theories and I'm proving that our ancestors cosmology is the truth. You are in a spirit realm. There's more to earth. It's a magical place you're living in. There's more to the human. You don't have to be in fear of this dumb, clumsy creator that they give you in this heliocentric model who creates a dumb cosmos with stuff moving around at any given moment. Something can end life on earth and clash into earth. This is how clumsy and dumb the creator is of the heliocentric universe. At any given moment, all its creation that it made can end itself because of the creator didn't build it stable. He got it whirling around a vacuum with asteroids and he got an asteroid belt with waste of chunks of rocks or dump yard with trash left over from previous experiments and little gas balls that's just floating over there that'll kill you if you go on them and planets and little materials floating around little gas bodies you can't go on them you'll die if you go in it it's scary he just got material all around this dumb clumsy universe there might be life out there but you gotta find it through the chaos go through the medias and go through all of that and you really think we smarter than the creator. We don't observe a reality this chaotic. When we observe our reality in nature, something we've all seem to have gotten away from, because we so far from nature, we're into the matrix. We're into the 
animated reality. The one NASA give you with their animations and CGI and green screen and illustrations and Photoshop. We believe that and ignore what's in front of our eyes. And we accept the universe that's this chaotic where objects are floating around without a foundation. As if man is smarter than the creator. Think about it. When we build a house, the first thing we do is lay a flat foundation with four corners. Okay? To build an arch on top of that flat foundation. We build a flat foundation to support an arch above our head. And if you look at this cosmology, it's as above, so below. You don't live on top of your roof. You live inside of your house. So you don't live on the surface of a balled up globe. You live in a cosmos that's made by an intelligent creator. How do they hide the intelligence of the creator and the perfection of the creation? By telling you it's leap year, like days are jumping or something, you know? By telling you that the sun and moon aren't equal to each other, masculine, feminine, lesser light, brighter light. You see they're equal because though the sunlight is brighter than the moon, the sun don't have any companions. The moonlight is dimmer than the sun, but the moon is accompanied by all of her children, the stars. So the moon has a tail, a star tail, and she brings in the night. Understand that on a bright day, if you were to travel all the way up above the sun, you would reach night again. Night is nut. Light travels linear and represents the male or Gab Horus raw energy. Night is nut, and you can see the skies in nut's arch. And the way you see nut arched over is the way we perceive our night sky, just like an arch. If we were inside of a temple, we all look up at Polaris. So the ancestors' cosmology can be proven. And like I said, darkness represents that cosmic womb of the mother that we all have to go back to because we all come from the darkness of creation, just like all ideas come from the darkness of a mind, just like all children come from the darkness of a womb, just like all humans come from a womb or a mother. Everything comes from the darkness. The darkness sits behind a day like the mother sits behind the child. If you think of the Madonna and child, the mother looks down upon the child like the night looks down upon the day, like Nut looks down upon Gab. But I get into this concept in my Black Hole Vedic series. You really need to check those out. That gets very interesting. I can't spend time on that too long. I'm sorry for getting on to a rant. It's important we understand how important this ancient cosmology is because we're in a cosmos with a foundation. Four corners can be represented by Nut's Two legs and two arms making contact. That represent foundation. The word for begins with F-O-U, just like the word foundation. When you talk foundation, you're talking about not an edge, but an ideology of stability. That what you would perceive as an edge is not a boundary or nothing to fear like the people who created the Helios cosmos. They looked up into the heavens and they thought that it was something to fear, but our ancestors knew we were enclosed and that the stars were fixed and that some were wandering stars, but they were all being held and that there were balance. The sky goddess Nut represents that. The stars are inside of her, not wandering around chaotic and bumping into each other. But to make a long story short, the fear is what creates the budget. So $50 million a day to NASA because they're telling you they're protecting you from these objects that we never experienced in our life. Craters aren't what you think they are. They're not caused by comets and asteroids, and I'll get into that as we move on because I believe that's a point that SETI actually made. Now let's move on. So in this next slide, it's basically part of slide number 14. What's stopping the oceans from emptying out? 
I basically answered that multiple times if you understand the cosmology and the ice wall. So again, this model that he's presenting here is an inaccurate depiction of what's being taught in the flat earth community. And uh, it's again, it's presented by controlled opposition. The same people who created the globe created this model so that when people try to explain flat earth and they find this thing, it'll look foolish. And it's the same thing I explained previously. I don't have to argue this model. When you look at Newton Gap, you can see how it all makes perfect sense and the waters are held in by the ice ring. And I think the brother brought up the tides, low tide, high tide, and the ancestors described this in a way that I like to call the cosmic breath, for lack of better words. If you understand what they taught about the North Pole, which is also being guarded by a treaty, you can understand that there's an entrance there and there's some sort of a drain type system that's built in the center of this earth. And also this is where a lot of magnetic energy reside. Now the stories that's associated with the North Pole as told by our ancestors are so interesting and ties in so much to the magic of our reality as opposed to the Santa Claus nonsense you get in this Western world and a pole that's tilted on a wobbly axis to blaspheme the perfection of creation. There's only one pole, it's magnetic and it's upright, just like we all should be. Now this pole, all compasses point to it. And the thing is, we can only wonder what's there. The government know, they have a treaty preventing you from finding out. So that's something we need to wonder because the ancestors said that the tree of life was there. Who knows? All I know is it's something that's making our compass point there and there's something magnetic there. And when we look at the ancient cosmology, we see that they do have something to hide that our ancestors already knew about. But like I said, it's been hidden from us with all of these treaties. So once again, I don't want to argue on behalf of the controlled opposition, government-funded Flat Earth Society's deception. He can argue this depiction with them. I teach the cosmology of the ancients. Most of you are familiar with Newton Gabe, so that's the one that I use. But everyone in the ancient world had this same cosmology of what I perceive as an infinite plane. And we are enclosed in some type of spherical structure, if you ask me. And we can prove that by rainbows because light reveals the shape of its container. Rainbows don't make a 360 all around the earth. They even tell you there's ends to the rainbow. So, I mean, there's a lot we got to take into consideration, but I'm going to move on. Slide number 15 presented by SETI. Where's the depths of the oceans? Where does the lava come from that shoot up from the volcanoes? Now, I already went into the earth core deception and broke down to you the deception that they gave us. There's no magma beneath your feet. Now we enter a realm of belief because none of us got drills. We never dug up under a volcano or up under the ground to see if it's full of magma, but they dug eight miles deep and they didn't find magma. I just told you it's coal under the ground. So with that being said, I can go into what volcanoes are, but I admit I'll be giving you my belief. If you ask me, my belief will be more in line with reality than their deception. There's clearly not liquid magma that fills the inside of a ball earth. I've already debunked the spherical globe concept with all of the points I've mentioned. And this whole concept of magma, I basically debunked with their own experiment. We need to reinvestigate volcanoes and that's something I'll be doing. See, I'm going to go and reinvestigate everything they taught me on my own instead of just accept what they gave us in a miseducation system firsthand without never questioning it my whole life. Because the moment I question the globe, I see that our ancestors was always right with their flat earth cosmology. So we should be investigating those above us because they're proven liars instead of accepting everything firsthand. So slide number 16 from Sarah Sutton Seti. If the dome is only on the top, what is protecting the bottom from planetary collisions? You see, our ancestors didn't have these fears 
when they looked up into the heavens. The people that created this hellish, chaotic cosmos, they didn't understand nature's perfect design, and they thought that the creator was a mischievous creator, so they created this type of cosmology that still plagues the world today, and it's actually an industry, a fear-driven industry that paints a bad representation of our real creator, which is perfect and balanced. You've never in your life witnessed a planetary collision or a meteor or asteroid or nothing striking the Earth, yet you believe in it just because you saw a few craters in the ground and you believe the stories that something crashed into the Earth. But when you start researching these craters and researching exactly how they say this stuff happened, you can debunk it in like five minutes. And in fact, it's an excellent video by Eric Dubay that does just that. And the links are in the description area. But craters and comets are not caused by comets or meteors striking the Earth. And that's only a belief. There are so many theories on the origination of these craters on the Earth. I'm choosing not to accept the lies from the deceivers who we've been proving to be liars time after time, and we know that they control us through fear and they capitalize off of that fear. This is no different. So when you see shooting stars, that's not a physical meteor or anything like that. That's a comet that's going to crash into Earth. This is the type of cosmology they want you to believe in to support the idea of a chaotic, mischievous creator that rule us in fear. At any given moment, life can end on Earth based on this clumsy creator. And you believe this. But you got to realize that when you see shooting stars, they never travel upward from the horizon or from the corner of the horizon or you know, dynamic ways as they would be if we were in the heliocentric cosmos with all of these millions of meteors going every second. When they're out there in space floating around, they tell you about these micro meteors that's all around them, and they're going at 10 times the speed of a bullet per millisecond all around them, yet they're so peaceful when they're floating around up there. And we still believe in meteors. We never see them on the space footage or even satellites that we still believe in. So I got a whole video on satellites. I don't want to get off subject into that. Check that out. But basically, planetary collisions don't exist outside of sci-fi and spookism that you see in movies in Hollywood. And understand that NASA and Hollywood has always worked hand in hand. The same people who make these space movies that's so convincing are the same people who help NASA fake space. It's all deception that you have to believe in. You have to believe and take their word from their equipment, trust their pictures and trust their images above your senses. Those days are over for Brother Sanchez. Hopefully they'll be over for Sarah Suit and Seti too. Because I'm showing you how easy it is to debunk all of the nonsense. So when you understand what planets really are, you will understand that it's impossible for planets to collide. What we're calling planets, the ancestors call wandering stars. And when you start to observe what we're calling planets through a telescope, they behave just as described by the ancestors as luminous beings, light beings celestial beings they're dynamic when you look at a star it's constantly moving and changing colors and shapes at every moment not possible if it was a physical object that you could land upon the footage you're looking at now is footage of the planet venus observed through a telescope and over time you can see that it wobbles and you can see holographic distortion and that's because these bodies aren't solid places. They're holographic light sources. Just as I explained with the sun and moon who are more dominant and seem to play greater roles. However, I've proven in the previous slides that they aren't physical. They have holographic properties and translucent in nature. So as the stars, so as the what we call planets, and everyone that has observed planets through their own telescope We'll have to admit that it's nothing like what NASA give us with their CGI and their fake drawings and illustrations. What they're calling planets were called luminaries by our ancestors. They weren't described as solid places. 
So shooting stars is something we need to think about because they travel in linear paths. And again, they never come upward, which should definitely happen on the globe at some point. These stars travel on a straight path. These stars are traveling the literal astral plane. You know, just the fact that everyone on Earth all look up at the same Polaris at any given time from any given location, that can only be possible on a flat Earth. On a globe, people at the bottom of it wouldn't be viewing Polaris. In fact, they would be viewing a whole nother night sky than what we're viewing on top of the globe or on any given side. We all wouldn't look up at the same night sky. Impossible on a globe. And again, like I demonstrated previously, impossible to see the sun and moon out at the same time on a globe. So what I'm doing now with point 16 is showing you the stability, the foundation of this plane we standing upon, and I'm proving it with facts. Sun and moon out at the same time on a globe would mean the people at the bottom of that globe will look up in the sky and see nothing. No sun, no moon at all. What kind of sky would that be like? So the fact that we can see the sun and moon out at the same time supports the ancient cosmology. That can only be possible on a flat plane. So just to drive that home even more, when you also look at the ancient cosmology, you notice that the sun and moon are the same size, yin and yang, as opposed to NASA sun worshippers, Masonic sun worshippers, where there's no balance, they rule out of chaos. They hide the mother, they hide the moon, the feminine, by balling her up into a globe in your mind. And the inhabitants upon her have the same behavior in how we treat her. You see, we treat the sanctuaries better than the earth because we forgot that the earth was the sanctuary. It's all based in the cosmology and how we perceive the creation, which will determine how we even perceive the creator. We understand the nature of the creator based on the creation. So now you should understand the big importance of NASA being controlled by the government and working hand in hand with the Vatican because it's all a religion. The Bible, the heliocentric cosmos, it's all different forms of heliocentrism by the same deceivers and secret societies who ruled us with this science for many years. But now the truth of the ancients is resurfacing at this time. So we're going to move right along and debunk the next point. Slide 17. If the sun is moving around the earth, what is keeping the rest of the galaxy in orbit? Now... If you understand that, again, the image he's using to the left is not the image that flat earthers use, so I will not argue that picture because it's not what I teach, but I will show you how the sun work on our ancestors' nut and gale model, what Brother Sanchez teach, as opposed to this bogus model to the right that he's using, which NASA don't even teach themselves. They abandoned that and they used the figure eight now. But like I said, he don't know his own model. So maybe he'll change that baloney now because they already saw all the flaws in it that I'm about to point out now while I show you how this sun really worked on our beautiful flat earth. Now let's get it. I showed you that the sun and moon out at the same time proves flat earth that can only be possible on a flat earth. And the way we see the moon based on our position on this flat plane, if you're looking at the demonstration in front of you, it show you how when the moon is out during the day, how the people on the other side of the plane that's experiencing nighttime see the moon faces in reverse from the people who's on the other side of the plane seeing the moon in their day sky because... If you look at the diagram below, you will see the moon based on your positioning on a plane. That's how you would perceive the faces of the moon makes perfect sense as opposed to the globe where they want us to believe that the moon is synced with the rotation of the earth so perfectly in this chaotic universe that we see the same face all the time. I did this experiment in a previous video where I explained this. You can check it out, but basically... If you just draw a circle on a piece of paper and put three random dots on it, tape it to the ceiling, 
move about the room in different angles looking up to it, you can see when you're moving around a room, you're going to see those faces different. So based on where you at on the earth, when you stop and look at the moon and look up, you're going to see it from that position. We all looking at the same moon differently from our location. Now, with that being said, when you understand I'm not arguing that bogus model he's trying to debunk, what I'm showing you is how the sun move on a flat earth. There is no sunset. Just the fact that you can get in a plane and follow the sun like some of these celebrities. They commuting on these jets, going to other parts of the plane, following the circuit of the sun, experiencing extended day, which can only be possible on a flat earth. If you can picture me and you, for example, at the beginning of a hallway in darkness with a lamp and I'm walking away from you down that hallway, eventually you'll be left in darkness. See, he don't understand that flat earthers don't believe in the same sun that NASA teaches. Flat earthers don't believe in a sun that's a burning ball of fire 93 million miles away. Sunspots prove a close sun. Again, the sun is a luminary. It's a light being. It's not fire. It's pure light. The sun they show us in their CGI deception and the sun that we see in our reality is totally different. Furthermore, the sun is a localized light source that's lighting up a particular part of the plane that it's focused on during that part of its circuit. And it carries that light with it, just like I demonstrated with the hallway experiment. So it's a localized limited light source that its pattern allows it to create a balanced day and night for everybody based on its pattern with the moon. And it's a perfect yin-yang balance and it can be represented in the yin-yang, which is a symbol of the balance of the sun and moon and how they create day and night above our flat plane. It makes perfect sense and it's so simple. You know, if the sun was 93 million miles away, we wouldn't be seeing crepuscular rays emanating from the sun making a hot spot over the ocean or over the plain. That wouldn't be possible if the sun was 93 million miles away, people. The sun is close and right above us, like the ancestor said. The model said he is accepting this baloney. The sun is not a burning ball 93 million miles away. The ancestors knew the truth what I'm telling you, and they had it all in their art like I'm showing you here. Crepuscular rays prove a close sun prove an intelligent creator. Our reality is so beautiful. You can trace those crepuscular rays back to a very close sun that's right above us. So if the sun was 93 million miles away, we wouldn't see crepuscular rays, people. That can only happen from a close light source. Furthermore, if the sun was 93 million miles away, there's no way possible we would be seeing clouds behind the sun and in front of the sun. Now, are the clouds 93 million miles away? If you look at this ancient cosmology, what we're seeing in this picture with the clouds behind the sun makes perfect sense because the ancestors have our sun right in the atmosphere circling above us with the moon and they're making a spiral type tornado pattern. And you look at this diagram in front of you based on its movements around certain areas, for example, the quote-unquote Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, you can see how it's a perfect yin-yang pattern that even creates the four seasons and distributes day and night evenly upon our plane, and they want to hide this perfection, the fact that the sun and moon makes a circuit, and a circuit is when we're dealing with a circle, which is a 360, which is the perfect circle, the pattern that the sun and moons make, not a 365. You get the five based on a deception and the wobble and the tilt that they put in the matrix cosmology, and they did it to hide the perfection of the creator and throw you in that Big Bang heliocentric cosmology that's ruled by gravity. See, gravity rules everything in that cosmology. It started from an explosion that just happened for no reason. No reason at all. You were created for no reason. Some just exploded. And ever since it exploded from that explosion, 
everything started falling away from that explosion point. And that falling away is what we call gravity. So gravity is really a bottomless pit of free for all based on an initial mishap or explosion for no reason. So it excluded any intelligent creator and put you in a vacuum of chaos. But it all exists only in your mind. And I'm trying to get you out of the matrix. Accept the ancestors truth. We are founded upon a plane. We are enclosed, protected, and the creator isn't a mischievous, clumsy, chaotic creator. So again, the sun is close. I am proving it with facts. I am disproving that it's 93 million miles away as shown by NASA's model, SETI's model. And also, the footage you're observing shows that the sun is a localized light source that carries its light with it as it moves creating night for those it leave behind and days for those it journey towards. Because as the sun move away from you, it leaves you in darkness and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That will only happen on a flat plane with a close sun as described by the ancestors. Can't happen on a globe with a sun 93 million miles away. We would detect no size difference in the sun 93 million miles away. Impossible. The fact that we can see the sun vary in size as it moves away and gets smaller shows exactly what the ancestors said. So please free your mind. I'm doing this out of love and I'm just trying to wake my brothers and sisters up out there and introduce them back to our true cosmology that was taken away from us and given to us along with the religions and the globe was given to us to replace this beautiful cosmology. And along with their cosmology is the fear-induced concepts of collisions and all of the above. So I prove my point. I prove that the sun is close and it's not the way it's being taught in the heliocentric model. Slide number 18 presented by SETI. I pretty much just described previously and I already debunked this one. He said if the sun was this close to the earth, it would burn up. Well, I just explained to you that flat earthers don't accept this model and that our ancestors didn't teach about the sun as being a burning ball of fire, which is given to us with NASA CGI and deception. The sun we experience is a very bright light. It's not a red burning ball of fire, and it's very close. As the sun moves away from you at the beach, it leaves you in coldness and darkness. When I was at the beach in San Diego, it was so bright during the noontime and we stayed at the beach all the way to nighttime. And uh, man, it was burning up during the noon. When the sun was over our head, man, it was burning up. And I watched the sun as it journeyed above us and vanished on the horizon and left our field of view. And as it left us in darkness, it took the warmth of it away and it took its light away with it. And you can see the moon following shortly behind. It's just so beautiful, the cosmology. And it's being hidden in your mind. You're not observing it because you're looking into their deception. You're looking at their animations. You're looking at the matrix. You're looking at the CGI. You're looking at all of the space programming, which is nothing but computer animations. None of the stuff is real. And that's why you believe in it, just like religions. But here I come with the facts today that you cannot disprove. I'm proving to you now that the sun is close and it's not a ball of fire. Sunspots on the ocean and crepuscular rays prove that, people. You can trace these rays right back up to a close sun. And not only that, the footage you're looking at shows pilots that are flying above the sun. Okay? This footage shows pilots that's flying above the sun. And you want me to believe that the sun is 93 million miles away? These pilots are 93 million miles away? We got to do more research. Point 17, point 18, both debunked. Let's move it right along. So slide number 19 presented by SETI is the one you're looking at here. I'm not sure what he was saying when he presented this, but I will speak on it. I've already disproven this in the previous slides. I've proven that the sun isn't 93 million miles away. 
and that is not a burning ball of fire. So what I will say just to touch on this slide and give you something to think about, if you look at the picture of the sun, what NASA is giving us over here on the right, yeah, it looks like a big red burning ball of fire. Look at the one at the bottom on the right and the top at the right. This is what they give us, but again, you either believe this or not, but this is the question you really need to ask. Look at the one in the top right corner. This is a picture of the sun. Keep in mind, they tell us that the sun is 93 million miles away. These are the questions that an investigator asks. Who took the picture? What took the picture? Question the observer. Question the one with the camera. How can that picture be real, y'all? They tell us that the sun is so ferocious, the heat of it, man, you can't even fathom it. This is what they say. So my first question is, what the hell kind of camera can withstand that type of heat to give us this picture from this view that we looking at in this top right corner of the sun? But see, we don't question this stuff this deep. They know the average person ain't going to question it this deep. Think about it. What kind of camera can get that close and the sun supposed to be doing all of these emissions every second, sending off corona emissions and solar flares every second and balls popping off and it's so violent. And don't forget the meteors and the micrometeors, people. It would be so many around this area based on the gravitational pull of the sun. It have been collected so many. Man, that's a damn good camera, y'all. Think about that kind of camera. You mean to tell me they ain't selling that kind of camera in the stores? They can charge a million dollars for that and it'll sell. That's a damn good camera. Think about that. That camera is giving us a picture of the sun this close and we don't question it. Another question. Why don't the camera that's giving us this picture of the sun ever turn around and pan around and do a 360 and just give us a good panoramic view of the whole area and look back at the earth and do a 180. You know why I don't do that? Because it's CGI. The same reason they never pan the camera around in none of the space footage, y'all. It's because what's called a fourth wall. There is no wall. It's the camera crew. If you pan the camera all the way around and do a 180, guess what? You'll be looking at the face of the cameraman who filming the deception. That's why when they in space, they ain't panning that camera all the way around showing you the stars back there because it's a camera crew back there filming them in a green screen, y'all. Filming them in a green screen environment. They got harnesses and all this stuff. They in water tanks with the green screen. Again, with $50 million a day, it's so easy to fake this stuff, especially when you're dealing with people as gullible as we are today who don't question nothing. They don't even got to use that much. They can do it with a 1000 a day for y'all, some of y'all. But I'm tearing this thing apart. We got to question what kind of camera can do that. They even tell you they're giving you live footage of the sun from space. What kind of camera can withstand these conditions and what kind of internet connection can stream this stuff from 93 million miles away? Tell me what kind of internet company, what service provider, is that Cox, is that CenturyLink? What internet service provider have an internet connection so strong that it can stream us live footage of the sun from 93 million miles away when some of y'all computers be freezing up on a rainy day. You better get real. I live in Las Vegas. As soon as we start getting out of the city and into the desert, you lose connections. But you telling me they got an internet connection that can stream us live footage from 93 million miles away and they ain't selling it and it ain't on the market? You know what? This stuff's so easy to debunk. Let me move it right on on along. So slide number 20 from SETI. If the Earth is not spinning with gravitational pull, what is keeping the moon in orbit? I'm not going to go into the whole thing about gravity. I explain density. And I'm also not going to go into 
the moon's orbit because I just explained to y'all how the sun and moon make their circuits above us in its perfect balance. It was represented in the yin yang by the ancestors. Now I go into that very in deep in detail in a lot of the previous videos, but I just dealt with it enough previously to debunk his claim. To drive it home even more and to deal with this, what I can deal with besides the gravity which I dealt with and the orbit of the moon and sun is the spin of the earth. This is very easy to debunk so it makes my work light. So how can I prove to you that the earth is not spinning? Think about it. If the earth was spinning a thousand miles per hour and let's just say it was spinning from east to west a thousand miles per hour from left to right and let's just say a plane took off from the airport and the plane took off in the same direction that the earth was spinning in and the earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour and that plane takes off in the same direction of the earth guess what people that plane will never make it to its destination because the earth will be carrying that city away as it spins away from the plane at a thousand miles per hour that plane that's traveling in the direction of the earth spinning will have to add a thousand miles per hour onto its initial speed in order to even make any kind of ground toward its destination. Think about it. The earth would always be moving that city away from that plane at a thousand miles per hour. Furthermore, think about this. If the earth was spinning at a thousand miles per hour, wouldn't the airplane just be able to hover above the ground and let the earth keep spinning and then just drop back down when its destination get beneath it? Think about it. Wouldn't airplanes be able to just go up in the sky and let the earth spin on and drop back down and get to where they're going? Think about this, people. It's very simple to see that we've been bamboozled and we've been lied to. The earth is not moving. It's not spinning. You never felt it spinning. You never would have believed me if I told you it was spinning. If you never would have been indoctrinated in their dumb Western sciences in schools that go against our ancestors. The ground beneath you is not bent and is not spinning. If you were on a globe, Anytime you look out in front of you, you will have to be looking down at the horizon. Everywhere you look would be downhill on a globe. And when you really think about it, it's really ludicrous. If you really think about it, like if the earth was spinning, you would be able to feel it or detect it. Especially if it's spinning at a thousand miles per hour. You get on a done merry-go-round, it's not even going above 10 miles per hour. And you'd be about to vomit you get off all dizzy and you telling me I'm spinning on something at a thousand miles per hour and water is flowing uphill and it's raining sideways. This pretty much wraps up part one of me debunking SETI. I got to put it in two parts because he did a four hour thing. He made a lot of points and I want to address them all, but I want to make it digestible. So I made this first part into 20 points. I ask that you join me for part two, especially if you're new to Flat Earth, because this is good that we have these type of videos so that we can learn the truth or at least hear the other side of the story. NASA didn't teach you what I'm telling you now about the ancestors. You wasn't taught this side. You wasn't taught the ancestor side. They taught us to laugh at them and say that they were stupid, but at least try to understand and investigate the two from an unbiased approach like a true investigator and gain clarity like I'm doing here today, putting them both up side by side and letting you decide for yourself. You are the jury. You make your own verdict based on the evidence I present to prove the facts and the theories they present, which you either believe in or not. Like I said, their science is a form of religion. So in summarizing all of this, let me just leave you with this. Airplanes are called planes for a reason. They fly even with the earth plane. Pilots are taught to fly even with the horizon. There's no way you can land a plane on a curved globe because you will have to plan for your landing with so little time to prepare for the landing. 
you will have to wait for the horizon to straighten back out as you descend. And this is not what pilots are doing. They're lining up their sights even with the horizon as they fly. You got to think about tools like a periscope. Navy submarines are able to lift their periscopes right above the Earth's surface and see ships that's hundreds of miles down. And they teach us that at six miles, we should be able to detect curvature. According to their globe model, if you were viewing a enemy vessel 100 miles down from your Navy submarine, you wouldn't be able to pick that vessel up on a globe based on that map because you would be staring at a big wall of water. Because remember, globe heads say all the time that the ships go over the curve. When you ask a globe head what happens to a ship at the horizon, they say it went over the curve, despite the fact that we can pull out a telescope, zoom in on it, and see every part of it from the bottom up. Where is the curve? It's only in your mind. It's a belief. So our eyesight has limitations. And if globe heads say we can see ships going over the curve, then a Navy submarine's periscope shouldn't be able to see a ship over 100 miles down from off of the surface of the water. If I'm standing from the shoreline seeing a ship go over the curve according to a globe head, but yet the Navy's periscope can rise just above the surface of the water and see a ship over 50 to 100 miles down, the math don't add up. All right, stay with me. I'm summarizing this thing as we close out because it's a lot said he got to deal with here. And man, buddy, he going to have his work cut out. And I got so many other questions for him because you're not going to be able to refute none of this stuff that I'm giving you. The ancestors' truth will always rise above NASA's foolishness. And those who true with themselves don't mind accepting the truth and admitting like Brother Sanchez, yo, they had me, man. Look at this picture. They don't have a real picture of Earth. How big is America, Seti? If they're not giving us consistent pictures of the Earth and they're clearly paintings and animations and drawings, even their visual analyzer admitted that this guy here in this picture, his name is Robert Simmon. He admitted that it's Photoshop and it has to be because the Earth is a plane. Any globe you produce is going to be fakery to hide the truth about our reality. The ancestors were correct. We're parts of an intelligent creation. It's not no dumb, chaotic design that we've been believing. Free y'all mind. I'm doing it just to wake you up. They are hiding the intelligence of the true creator. So listen, people, with everything that's been presented here, it's safe to say that hands down, the globe has been debunked and SETI has been defeated by a landslide. And I'm not just bragging. But this is what happens when you go against the truth with their theories, modern theories versus ancient truth, beliefs versus proven facts. And I've proved all of my facts. You don't have to believe none of it. Replay the video, sink it in deeply. Do your research on flat earth. So slide number one presented by SETI is the one you're looking at now. And basically with this slide, he's explaining gravity to us. And we all basically grew up looking at this diagram. Thanks, SETI, for reteaching us something that we all, you know, already know. I'm pretty sure all the flat earthers know about this. But just to address the whole issue here, there's more than one way to explain what keeps us grounded to the earth. And what y'all got to keep in mind is that the ancestors who live way before us, they understood what held them to the earth. But during that time, there was no word called gravity. So how did they explain that force without the word called gravity? Because gravity is just a new word that was created when they created the globe. So wouldn't it be interesting to say, hmm, Brother Sanchez, ain't that interesting? What did the ancestors say about gravity? Because they didn't have a word in their vocabulary for gravity. So how did they define it? Wouldn't that be interesting when you want to know? So that's what I'm going to do today. Since we all know about gravity, Seti, let's think about it. I'm teaching ancient African flat earth cosmology. 
and our ancestors didn't have a word in their dictionary for gravity, y'all. They didn't speak this language. No one knows the language that the original pre-dynastic people spoke. They still trying to decode this stuff, but I tell you this right here, though. You don't have to know the language to understand their concept of certain laws that govern nature. You can create your own word for it, but that won't change the concept. Gravity is a theory of what holds us to the earth. It's not a fact. Density is a fact that explains what keeps all things grounded. And that's what the ancestors spoke of. But they also didn't have a word called density. But density is the ancient concept. Gravity is not. It's a new concept. Again, that word is new. I'm going to explain to you right now how the ancestors explain what keeps us grounded to the earth. And then I'm going to explain why gravity is a theory and not a fact and how it really makes no sense. So the reason gravity is only a theoretical law, it's because it can't be proven. The reason it can't be proven is because, for example, gravity supposedly explains what keeps water stuck to the earth. But then that law of gravity starts to fall apart when the investigator says, hmm, if gravity is so strong that it's holding all of the waters in the ocean to the earth, how can butterflies break this law? Do you know how many pounds that all of the waters in the ocean weigh? Do you know how much water that is? They're telling you gravity holds that to the earth, but yet a butterfly can fly right above the ocean water, none pulling it down. A butterfly that don't even weigh a pound, don't even weigh more than a penny, can break the law of gravity and fly high as it want to. But gravity is so strong, it's holding all the oceans to the earth. But a butterfly can break its law. If I put helium in a balloon, it'll float and break the law of gravity. A balloon breaks this law. But yet it can hold all the water to the earth. It doesn't make sense. Anyone honest with themselves and with logic will see that. So since gravity don't make sense, what does? It's called density. Now allow me to explain. What keeps us stuck to the earth? Your own weight keeps you stuck to the earth. Now let me explain how this works. The air particles around you determine what floats up in the air or what stays grounded to the earth. How do they determine it, Brother Sanchez? Well, anything lighter than the air particles that surround us will float. And anything that's heavier than those particles will stay grounded to the earth. So, for example, there's a gas called helium. And helium gas is lighter than the air particles or the oxygen particles around us. Therefore, when you put helium in a balloon, the balloon will always rise because helium rises. The lightest things rise. So again, helium is lighter than oxygen or the air particles around us, oxygen particles. Therefore, helium gas, helium particles rise above oxygen particles. Everything separates itself in perfect balance based on density. Because helium is lighter than oxygen, you can put helium in a balloon and that balloon will break that theoretical law of gravity because density is what's real. Gravity is what's fake. That's why it's a theory and not a fact. When we deal with density, it makes perfect sense why helium balloons can break the law of gravity because density allows them to rise. Density says that Anything lighter than the oxygen particles around them will float and anything that's heavier will stay grounded. So if you want to look at this same example as it relates to water to get better clarity on it, think about a ship. Think if you were at the ocean and you dropped a pebble into the water, that pebble will sink. But a cruise ship can float because it's full of oxygen. Now, oxygen particles weigh less than water particles. That's why bubbles rise to the surface. So everything is organized and all the particles is stacked up and organized based on its own density. Oxygen is a particle, but it's not uh, lighter than helium. So helium rises above oxygen. But water particles is not lighter than oxygen particles. Therefore, when you put air in the water, bubbles form and they immediately 
find their way to the surface. And there's nothing you can do to stop that bubble from going to that surface. It ain't nothing you can do to trap that bubble down. It will find its way to the surface, buddy, because Mother Nature got everything organized. So you can't keep air particles or oxygen particles submerged because those particles weigh less than water particles. This is why ships can float because they full of air and air can't sink. It's very, very simple, people. Like I said, gravity can't exist. That's why it's just a theory. If it does exist, it's a weak ass law if a butterfly can break it. But density explains all of this. So I'm just giving you the truth. Now I want to deal with this picture on another aspect because a lot of people that accept the globe use this to explain how the moon causes the tides and how the moon revolves around the earth. So let's deal with that before we move on. So now that we got gravity debunked, and we got y'all understanding the reality of what governs things, it's perfect balance, it's density, we can move on and we can see what's happening with the orbit of the moon. It's the gravitational pull of the Earth causing the moon's orbit. This is what they teach us, so let's deal with it. So according to their science, what keeps the moon orbit sustained is the Earth gravitational pull, basically swinging it around as it rotates. They're locked together in its gravitational pull, and they're saying that the Earth is bigger than the moon, so the Earth is pulling the moon toward it. They're saying that in so many years, because of this, our moon is going to be so close to us that eventually it's going to collide back with us and end all life. So this is what they teach, that the Earth is constantly pulling the moon toward us. And they're saying also that the moon is so powerful, it's controlling the tides. I want y'all to think about this. They saying the moon's so small that the earth gravitational pull is pulling the moon toward earth and swinging it around, causing the moon orbit. But they say the moon's so powerful that it's causing the earth tide. I'm finna debunk them both right here. Check this out. According to the BBC, the moon is kept in orbit by the gravitational force that it exerts on it, but the moon also exerts a gravitational force, and this causes the movement of the Earth's oceans to form a tidal bulge. This is what they teach. We got to get this out before we move forward. Well, I don't think SETI even know what they teach, but according to the BBC, something I want y'all to keep locked in your head is that our science teaches us that the moon is moving away from Earth at about 1.48 degrees or 1.48 inches per year, I mean. So you go and do your research on that, you will see that our science teaches us that the moon is moving further away from us every year. They teach us that every year the moon moves away from us at 1.48 inches, but yet they still teach us that one day the earth gonna pull the moon toward the earth and cause a collision. How can it be both, people? How can it be both? See, I don't have to get worked up like said it because I got truth. I got logic. Those who deny it, they're just the people who live in a lie. The only people deny truth are those living a lie. Ain't no way you're going to tell me that every year the moon getting further away from me and still teach me that at one day the moon going to be so close to earth it's going to collide. It can't be both. Now, since we got that nonsense debunked, let's move on and let's debunk. Do the moon control the ocean tides? Do the gravitational pull of the moon control the water that's on Earth? Heck no, it doesn't. Well, how can you prove it, Brother Sanchez? Anybody can do a simple experiment to prove that. If the gravitational pull of the moon is so powerful that it's controlling the waters in the ocean and controlling the tides, then I should be able to stand up under the moonlight with a cup of water and see that same gravitational pull. Laugh all you want to, but this is real science and real logic. Any globe here a laugh because that debunks that whole nonsense. Think about what I'm telling you, people who like truth. If the moon is strong enough to be controlling the goddamn ocean water and causing the tides, why am I able to go to the beach and lay my cup of water on my table on the shore 
and it don't do the same thing to my cup of water. Think about it, people. It ain't about the answers. It's the questions that get you closer to the truth. It's these questions that Brother Sanchez is asking that they can't answer, that debunks the crap. Said it can't answer that. That's why he gonna keep making videos with his ego blinding him and calling us names and debunking a flat earth model that none of us even accept. I don't know what his agenda is, but I got love for that brother. And I want him to know that he going against one of the biggest awakenings on earth right now, brother. There's no way how you can explain to me that if the moon is controlling the ocean tides and controlling all that water in the ocean because its gravitational pull is that strong that I can be at the same ocean on the shore sitting down on my blanket with a cup of water on my table and the surface of my cup of water is flat, not even moving. But the ocean moving because they said the moon doing it. But the moon ain't touching my water, though. The moon is selective, y'all. The moon pick and choose on what it want to have a gravitational pull on. So the moon will control all the ocean and the tides, but it won't do none of your cup when you're drinking water up under the moon. You can go outside and put a table right up under a full moon and sit a cup of water on it, and the surface of that water will remain flat all night until the sunset. So the moon can't be controlling the water in the ocean, which weighs so many pounds you can't even imagine it. But yet I'm right at the shore at the same ocean and it ain't doing shit to my water. You better get real and start using your head unless you love being misled. That's what I think your problem is. I think y'all addicted with being food and bamboozled. And I'm trying to wake you up and you want to thread our lives and sick the goons on us when we telling you that these people robbing our children out of 50 million damn dollars a day and brother Sanchez debunking this shit while I'm drinking my damn smoothie. Now let's move on to his next slide and debunk some more of this nonsense. You can't prove these damn theories against the facts. You know, before I debunk this next slide, and put the beating on this damn nonsense, let me just say something. I think it's real sad that all I'm doing right now is asking questions that the government can't answer, that said it can't answer, questions that said it need to be asking, said it need to be saying, damn, bro, Sanchez, you right about that. Them bastards told us that the Earth's shadow caused moon phases, but how the hell can a circular Earth cause a straight line half moon? You right, bro, Sanchez. Instead of said it doing that, he want to sick the goons on his brother and say, man, if them niggas teaching flat earth, shoot them, beat them. I ain't saying that's what he's saying, but the energy he giving off is that's what that's what's going on. Negroes showing up on me, fall back on SETI with this flat earth shit, nigga, the globe and all like this, like we gang banging with this science. That's called ignorance, y'all. That's what I'm trying to get SETI out of. But you got to humble yourself in order to see that you're wrong, SETI. Man, I got love for you, dog. But you know you can't answer these questions. And if Neil deGrasse Tyson and the government can't answer them, but SETI can, then SETI, they should be paying you, man, not Neil deGrasse Tyson. For real. We shouldn't be seeing the moon phases as a circle if Neil deGrasse Tyson said the earth is a pair, we should be seeing a pair shadow when we look at the moon because the earth is a pair or it's an oblate spheroid. Why the damn moon phases is a perfect circle, though. So none of this stuff makes sense. And like I say, it's the questions that can't be answered that I'm asking. It ain't always the answers. They front like they got the answers, but I got the questions that prove they ain't got shit. You can't answer these questions and you got to answer them to be able to say you got a fact. If I'm debunking your facts and you can't answer my questions, you just going to make videos ignoring them. You ain't debunking shit. I'm addressing every last one of your slides individually, but you ain't answering none of these questions that I'm debunking your shit with. Nevertheless, let's keep it moving. So slide number two, how can you cause an eclipse on a cycle like this? That's a good reasonable question. I actually got a whole video that explains eclipses on flat earth, but the demonstration you're looking at right now explains eclipses as taught by our ancient ancestors, which make perfect sense. 
the way they explain eclipses make no sense at all. They said that it's the moon passing in between the sun and the earth causing lunar eclipses. Yeah, that sounds really convenient until I ask another question that they can't explain. If that's the case, how the hell is you looking at this video footage in front of you now of a lunar eclipse at sunrise? You really need to think about the footage that you're looking at right now. In this footage, you are looking at the sun and moon directly apart. I mean, they are separated from each other. I mean, 180 degrees face to face from each other, yet the moon is still being eclipsed by something. And if you look from where he's standing up at this elevation, when you look over at the sun, it's a flat horizon. And when you look over at the moon, when he pan the camera all around him, it's a flat horizon from at that elevation. And you can see the sun and moon all the way down the plane. You know how far away the sun and moon is from him? Should be hidden by curvature from his elevation, y'all. The earth should actually be in between the sun and moon and more elevated and its shadow should be causing the eclipse. But what's going on is that it's proven that our ancestors model is real. You see, one way eclipses are caused on the flat earth model is the way you're looking at now. But there are some times in our reality when we have a phenomenon where eclipse happen and the sun and moon aren't converging with each other. In this case, because if the sun is on one side and the moon is on the other side, what's causing this eclipse? I'll tell you what's causing it. It's a whole completely different body. They're called the lunar nodes in Western academics, and they do that to hide the truth. But it's really the black hole suns that were spoken of by the ancient ancestors, to be brief. Even in Vedic cosmology, they describe this whole event in a story of Rahu and Ketu, which is their version of the lunar nodes. And they use these two to describe solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. It's very interesting and it makes way more sense on an ancient ancestor's cosmology. So go and check out my Flat Earth video on eclipses. I got a couple of them. Just check them out and it'll go into this in detail. But basically I've proven that Eclipses can't happen on the globe. What they telling us for solar eclipses and lunar eclipses isn't right because sometimes the explanation they give is debunked in the case that I'm showing you now. When you got a lunar eclipse at doggone sunset, they don't know how to explain that. And if you look at this video right here from the original uploader, this dude sound real stupid trying to explain it. He actually went viral even globe heads was mocking him and they said how stupid he is because there's no way to explain this stuff and no globe heads will try to explain it. The only way it can be explained is when you look at the ancient cosmology. So yes, solar eclipses, lunar eclipses are caused when the um, sun and moon converge and pair up with one another. In other words, when the moon actually catch up with the sun and they converge and become one and they continue on their circuits. That's one way. You say, well, if that happened, then why the sun and moon don't crash together? Because again, they're not physical objects. They're just light beings. They go clean through one another like a marriage. They become one. When you get the MasterCard symbol, show you the beginning process, but then the total eclipse is represented by the diamond ring that we put on a woman. You can even see that concept in the lunar eclipse because we're dealing with the moon, which is feminine. So when the lunar eclipse happened, you see the diamond ring effect. We put the diamond ring on the women for marriage. All of this stuff I go in deep. I get into masculine, feminine, all of that with these eclipses in my Vedic black hole eclipses video that I did. But just to keep this brief, so because I got a lot of points that he had to deal with, I'm going to keep it moving. I think I proved my point here. And if you still don't think I proved my point, here's just another footage before we move on of a lunar eclipse at sunrise. And this is in Toronto. Keep in mind that the sun is behind us. The sun is behind the camera. 
and you can see this time-lapse footage of the moon approaching the horizon. But as you can see, some object gobbling it up. This was represented as Rahu and Ketu in Vedic astrology. And they said it was a mysterious, shadowy object. So there are objects above us that move in mysterious ways and that we can't always explain and we'll never be able to explain as long as we keep believing NASA dumb talk and ignoring our ancestors, ignoring the real magic of our reality. Look at this picture right here of this red object passing by the moon. NASA don't show y'all this stuff. People catch this with their cameras. It's other objects in the sky. And these are light objects. They ain't physical. They're light beings. So I hope this explains eclipses for you guys. Remember, when you look at this ancient map right here, you see two sets of suns, two sets of moons, one for our Earth circle at the center, and you see there's another ring around us of lands that's been hidden by the government. But I got into that in previous videos. Listen, basically wanted to say that if you look at this map, you will see those two black suns or those two black nodes, the lunar nodes, Rahu Ketu, the black hole suns. You can actually see that in this map. So there's other explanations besides what you just learned your whole life from the government about how Eclipse was caused, what all of us learned. I learned the same thing Seti learned, and he reteaching it to us like we don't know it. But nobody heard this stuff that I'm telling you. All I'm doing is showing you what was hidden from you. You don't got to accept it, but it makes a hell of a lot of more sense than me than what our government lying ass is telling us. So why would you defend them, Seti? and go against your brother, man. They don't got your best interest in mind. I will ride for you, my brother. This go beyond flat earth, globe earth. Said it, I want you to know that I'll ride for you, bro. Real talk, but I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna be your yes man. I ain't gonna like your subscribers and all of them I ain't no follower. See, my subscribers are teachers. They do their own studying. They even investigate and study the shit that I'm telling them. They question and challenge what I'm saying, and I love it. That's the kind of environment we got over here. That's the kind of environment you need for proper study. Not one man saying, believe me, and when you don't, I'm going to put the goons on you and have you killed. We can't be bringing that thugging shit in the science fields. We just trying to understand the lies that they told all of us. And flat earthers questioning their ass. Don't be defending the government. Even if you disagree with us, let us get a government this work. Quit goddamn defending them, because the shit that I'm showing you in this video, you are the government can't debunk. Now let's go and debunk some more of this crap. <laughs> so again, in this next slide, he says the earth is too small. My brother, when you say too small in that context, it's T-O-O, -O, not T-O. You use T-O when you're saying, put some more thought into it. Come together. Let's hop right to it. Those are examples, my brother, of when you would use T-O. The example you use, you would use T-O-O. -O. But anyway, the earth is too small to produce any type of force to cause something as large as the sun to revolve around it. He's saying the earth is too small because he's looking at the wrong model. The ancestors taught that the earth was an infinite plane. And if you look at the model that I'm showing you right now, it works perfectly on our ancestors' model. It actually makes more sense on this model than the model that they give us. The sun and moon are equal in size. If you look at all ancient carvings of the cosmos, you will see my art sometimes balancing the sun and moon, 50-50, yin and yang, sun and moon. They're equal in size, and the mother balances them both. The thing about the sun worshippers, they want the sun to be big as hell and dominate everything. But the only proof they got to support it is CGI, illustrations, animations. And you will never see a sun like what they show you in none of these pictures. Said it believe in drawings and CGI computer animations. He believe in a burning red ass sun that's 93 million miles away. But yet when he go to the ocean, y'all, he sees sunspots below the sun because the sun making crepuscular rays. And if you trace these crepuscular rays, they'll prove to you that the sun ain't 93 million miles away. If you want to look at this picture 
and think that if you trace them rays all the way to the sun, you got to go 93 million miles. You got to be a fool. How the hell can a sun be 93 million miles away making a local hot spot right above the damn ocean? Crepuscular rays you can trace right back to a close sun. What do you think these carvings of our ancestors was trying to tell y'all Negroes that the sun is close? Don't be deceived by the people who giving you the hell cosmology. The one that rule you in filth. Without no balance, got the sun dominating above the damn mother like a fool. The same people that attack mother nature. You can mock it all you want, but you know it resonates with you. Don't you deny the truth, people. The sun can't be a burning ball 93 million miles away and we looking at this picture of a close sun making crepuscular rays that you can trace right above your head. This footage you looking at now showing pilots flying above the sun. How can that happen? You mean to tell me these pilots 93 million miles away said it? Clouds behind the sun, so the clouds 93 million miles away. I think I proved my point here. I proved that the sun ain't no burning ball 93 million miles away and that the way the sun and moon operate was explained by the yin-yang, by our ancestors, balance, and it makes perfect sense. Go to Kemet, look at them walls. You say you been, your show ain't arguing for Newton Gale. You arguing for NASA. So the sun and moon is yin and yang according to our ancestors. The sun ain't bigger than the moon and dominating this cosmology like them sun worshiping masons want y'all to believe. And you got to believe it. You can't know it because you holding on to these dumbass animations of this big red ass ball of lava. Y'all believe this crap, man. We ain't teaching our children to investigate these deceivers. We teaching them just accept it and regurgitate it. When they brother come along and say, hey, they deceiving us yet again, you argue on their behalf because of cognitive dissonance. Our ancestors' cosmology is beautiful. Our reality, our cosmology is beautiful, man. The shit they giving us induces fear. We don't have a mischievous creator in this chaotic-ass cosmology they've been selling to us. It's time to wake up, humanity. Now let's move on and debunk some more upset as nonsense. So this next slide, which is slide number four, we already just debunked. This is just part of slide number three. So we're going to just keep it moving. But before we do that, I just want to point out something to you about sun worship. In the top left corner, he's putting a model up there that flat earthers don't teach about. I don't accept that model, said it. That's a dumbass flat earth model. We don't teach about that. We teach Nut and Gay up ancient cosmology, something your ass running from. How can you debate flat earth and not bring up Nut and Gay up? You're running from it. You don't want to disprove the Kemet that you say you love, but you still want to keep the alien talk and all of that shit, and you don't want to be wrong, so you want to rep Kemet, but still rep NASA's globe and go against Nut and Gay up. So I don't want to argue with that model in the top left because everyone know I teach Nut and Gab. I don't teach that dumb model he's got up there. Basically, if you look at this image on the bottom, it's a bunch of CGI deception. This sun and this earth is animations computer generated. None of this stuff is real. And they got earth as a little drawn in little blue speck. That's blasphemy. Our ancestors taught that the earth was the center of the universe and the stage. The earth is an infinite plane, but in this damn backwards world, it's a little blue marble. Now, we say these people lie about everything and everything they tell us is the opposite. Yet our ancestors teach about earth as an infinite plane and they teach about it as a little blue ball and you believe them. But you still say everything is backwards in the world. But you still believe the earth a little blue ball instead of it's an infinite plane. But you say everything backwards, though. I'd rather go with the ancestors than these deceivers. So this is blasphemy, y'all. This is the art of sun worshippers. Just like in this ancient art you're looking at now, these people created this art because they didn't understand the stability of our cosmos. Our ancestors had Nut and Gale. 
they had the stars enclosed inside of Nut, and they had the sun and moon inside of Nut. If you look at ancient Kemetic cosmology, the sun and moon ain't on the outside of Nut. They on the inside of her above Gab, just like they circle above the earth plane in our reality. And they're equal in size, and they do just like I'm showing you in this example, just like the ancestors said. And they're very close, just like the ancestors drew in their art right here. They looked at these crepuscular rays and made the same conclusion that Brother Sanchez made. Hey, the sun got to be close if we looking at these rays and we can trace them right there to the sun. It ain't that far. The ancestors rejoiced. They lived in a beautiful reality because they understood how smart and intelligent the creator was. Yet y'all accept this dumbass cosmology that they give you with animations and the CGI and the damn drawings and the computer shit. That ain't no real sun, y'all. That's made on a computer. I can go make that. The sun you see in reality, I'm showing you in this footage here. How can they be the same? How can it be 93 million miles away, a red ball burning like hell, when I'm showing you a beautiful sun above the ocean that's close as hell, and you can prove it with the crepuscular rays, just like the ancestors did? And if it was fucking a burning ball and it was that close, then the water be boiling beneath it. So that sun is just a luminous light body and it's a beautiful object that we won't understand if we keep looking at their damn deception and ignoring our ancestors. So said I'm doing this out of love, brother. So slide number five, what does the horizontal upside down world look like? I guess that's what he mean. Well, again, he don't have a clear understanding of what flat earthers are teaching and he's embarrassing his damn self. He even admitted that he didn't research it. Now, think about this, people. What if you paid thousands of dollars to send your kids to a university and a professor showed up to class? And when they showed up in front of the class, they say, hey, get your notebooks out. I'm about to teach y'all about Earth today, but I have never researched it. I'm just teaching this shit, but I never researched it. You'll scratch your head and be like, what the hell? How can you really teach something you never researched? Think about it. If I never researched airplanes, how can I go and do a lecture at Boeing? If I never fucking research airplanes, how can I stand up there and give y'all a lecture for Boeing and break down the damn 727s and I don't even know the damn names of them. Show you how much research I did, but with not doing no research, I can go and do a whole lecture on it. This is the stupidity of SETI. And I respect this brother because I learned from him in the past, but I hate to see what he's doing to himself now. He's growing, he's getting popular, he's getting a God-like attitude, it's starting a cult-like following, and it's not healthy for the community. Because now when you try to question these people, people think you're down talking them and they want to try to hurt you and harm you. When I'm questioning the government, I'm showing you NASA line to all of us. Neil deGrasse Tyson and these bastards who pushing this space program, that's just what it is, a program, just like television programming. It's all to manipulate the mind and hide the truth about your reality. Why would you think your government give you the truth about your reality? You think they love you enough to give you the truth about your reality, but still spraying your ass with chemtrails every day, vaccinating your children, poisoning your water? But you think they care enough about you to tell you the truth about your cosmology, about the creation, which you're directly connected to. Hell no. Especially not when they got multi-million dollar programs based on you believing this shit and staying scared so they can keep the programs and budgets going. So stop defending the government, said it. Help me defend our ancestors, brother. They were flat earthers. So again, if Earth is an infinite plane, I can't tell you what's up under it. But if you want to go by this dumbass model that nobody really believe in, I don't think no flat earthers believe in that. Every flat earther know that that's a government created this to make fun of us. 
And that's exactly what SETI is doing. He helping the government make fun of his brothers who on to their bullshit instead of standing by our side saying, listen, man, I want to try to understand it because this 50 million dollars, my kids can use it. And we working hard, barely can make ends meet. And this space program taking 50 million dollars a day. Shit, I'm with you, bro, Sanchez. Let me try to understand it. Instead, he fall right for their deception. Take this model that they put out to have us humiliated with and do just that. Because said it don't do real investigation, y'all. But we're going to keep it moving and I'm going to keep on debunking this nonsense. So slide number six by Seti. It's part of slide number five, dealing with the same thing about under this disc and how the sun and moon work. We don't want to get into that again, y'all. Let's keep it moving. We don't want to be redundant. Okay, so next slide, slide number seven is, are there people on the other side of the planet and why not? What do they look like and what are the names of the nations and peoples? What he's saying is, are there people living up under that disc where they got that little dirt? them little dirt mountains hanging at but again it's easy to criticize and humiliate this dumbass model that the government put out there for people to do just that when they hear flat earth but you gotta dig deeper you just can't debunk this government deception and think you investigated flat earth there's much to it and i'm showing you all of that here as well as many previous videos that you all need to explore on this channel Check these videos out. Mirror the uploads. Put them on your channel. You have my permission. Put this stuff out there, y'all, because they're going to be shutting it down soon. We got to reach as many people as we can with the truth. So he said about other nations and peoples that may exist. Well, in my previous part one, what I did, I spent a huge part of that part one debunking said it explaining hidden lands and i just did a whole sit down with you been exposed and we went on about the uh mysteries of the races and all of that and all of the land that they hiding with these treaties but that's off the subject that's about lands and people he's trying to be funny you know about this little image here i basically told y'all that i don't accept this image that's deception but I do want to say that I do have a video talking about nations and other people that's being hidden from us, even though that's off the subject of me debunking him and he wasn't asking about that. I would like y'all to check that stuff out. But let me get back on subject and stay with the slides. <laughs> Slide number eight by my brother, Sarah Sutton Seti, the general. And listen, y'all, that's my brother. All right. This is science. Said it has a lot to teach and a lot that you can learn from, but he's not versed in this area of cosmology, and he, he did admit that. He said he didn't research it. So why he keep on making videos embarrassing himself, I don't know, because people who did research it just going to keep tearing him apart, and the more he do it, the more credibility he going to lose because everybody ain't followers. Everybody ain't yes men. That's what he hoping on. But some of us really want to know the truth. And for those who do, that's the only reason I'm doing this video to give you both sides. So he said you would literally have to fly upside down or visit the opposite side of the planet. But he's using this wrong model. People, let me show you how airplanes move above our flat plane. I already went over this in a previous video that this is how airplanes move on a flat earth. Very simple, above your head in circles, just like the sun and moon move. All right, it's not nothing I got to go into for hours and minutes. He using the wrong model. That's why it don't make no sense. But what you see here makes perfect sense. So come on, people. If you want me to go deeper into that, then watch part one. I speak about it for more time. I'm showing you right here how ships sail around the flat earth. They not going over a ball of water. Water don't flow uphill. Okay, it don't bend. Ships ain't going over a curve at the horizon when you're looking in front of you. Because if that's true, then why it ain't going over the horizon when you look at Adam to the left and right of you? That should be true on both axes, your Y axis and X axis. It just can't happen in the front. That will make the earth a rolled up piece of carpet. If we just see them go over the curve in the front, but the side stretch on though. Why ships don't go over the curb left and right? If the curb in front of you, that's what they say to you. Pull out a telescope and zoom in. Then you can see the ship. 
But a globe head think they can see like eagles, y'all. They think they got eyes like robots. They think they eyes are the telescope. They don't think that humans got eye limitations and we can't see far, far, far. Light you can see far because it's emanating. But that's a whole nother lecture. Basically, he misinterpreted. He getting it all wrong with this airplane. Furthermore, airplanes could only fly even with the plane. They're called a plane for a reason. Airplanes fly even with the plane. They teach you in pilot school to fly even with the horizon. If you was on a globe, ain't no way you can do that because you'll be looking at a damn curve, not a horizontal horizon. Can you imagine trying to land a damn plane on a globe that's moving a thousand miles per hour? Can you imagine somebody being so stupid even trying to fly a plane on a planet moving thousand of miles per hour when all you got to do is raise up off the ground and let the planet keep moving and just drop down when your city get up under you? The globe don't make sense, y'all. It's really laughable when you start investigating it. Now, the way planes fly makes sense above the plane. If it was fucking trying to fly on a globe, it would have to constantly nosedive to keep from flying out into outer space. If we was at the beach looking in front of us at a ship go over the horizon, globe heads say that that ship going over a curve. But yet, if an airplane was flying above that ship, we'll still see the airplane, but we won't see the damn ship. But the globe, they show you it got the clouds and the sky bending with the water. So shouldn't the damn clouds be curving down with the curve that we see in the ocean? Use your doggone head, people. How the hell the ship going over the curve, but the plane ain't going over the curve? If I'm a pilot that's flying above the damn ship, at the point the ship go over that curve, I should be dipping my nose so I don't fly off into space. If that's true, if a plane was following above that ship, when that ship go over the curve, the plane would have to dip its nose down so it don't go off into outer space. If the ship going over the curve at that point, it don't make sense on a globe. But it make perfect sense on a flat earth. And it also explain why airplanes fly even with the plane. Accept the truth of our ancestors, brother. They hear the truth from us about our ancestors. I'm just giving it to you. Don't have cognitive dissonance. That's what we had when we came out of the religions. We didn't want to believe them gods when real. But now I'm here to restore balance and bang the hammer. Ma'at. Mother nature shall be restored, and it's going to happen with truth. Point number eight, debunk. Let's move forward. <laughs> Slide number nine by General Seti. Without gravity, how can you stand upside down on a planet? I apologize for being so redundant, but I want to deal with each slide. Again, I don't accept the model he's using. So nobody got to worry about you standing upside down on them little mountains that they drew there. And the picture to the left, I really don't understand why he would even go through the trouble pasting this dumb shit together. General, open your mind. Stop being so full of ego, brother. Stop, man. Research this shit, man. I'm tearing your damn globe apart. And I hate to do this to you. But I'm really doing it to NASA. I'm doing it to the government and their model. So you getting your ass caught in the crossfire trying to defend your government. When the people wake up to this deception, you don't want to be in the way, bro. You don't want to be in the way. We tired of being deceived. There's no way I can be debunking this shit this quick on these videos and we believed it all our life. The same thing with religion. We be in it most of our life and somebody come along and tell us about the Council of Nicaea and how it all and give us back the story of it. Free our minds. We, we reject it at first. We rebuke them at first. But we eventually research it and get over it. We was wrong and now we happy and we move on. But there's more that we're wrong about. The globe is one of them. And I'm clearly proving it to you now, people. I'm proving that our ancestors was telling the truth. You're on a flat earth and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. People don't mock your ancestors like everyone else did throughout history. 
So I explain gravity. I explain everything in this slide. Let's move to the next slide. In this slide right here, he got this nigga here is phenomenal. And I just wanted to put this up here too, even though it don't got nothing to do with flat earth. I could have left this one out, of course. I just wanted to show y'all the ego at play. You didn't research none of this shit. You admitted you didn't. And because of it, we ripping this shit apart because we actually researched it. Flat Earthers actually researched this stuff. We all learned about the globe. So Flat Earthers didn't go and research the globe when they heard about Flat Earth truth. They went and researched the ancients and they started putting it to the test and they found out, damn, it really ain't no curvature. Damn it, y'all, it's really true. The ancestors was telling the truth. But if you live your whole life believing the globe, and you never say, man, let me see if the ancestors was true. Because it is called a horizon because it's horizontal. It is called a planet because it's a plane enclosed in a nut or net. I'm proving to you with each slide that our earth is flat and not a globe. You can't deny what I'm showing you. So for you to have that much ego on a subject you didn't research and that I'm picking apart slide by slide. It shows you where we at in our conscious community. We at a dangerous point where ego and insults are valued more than facts, proof, evidence, truth, swagger and tough talk, threats and mockery. The same thing Neil deGrasse Tyson doing. That's who they learn it from, y'all. We in a matrix. Said it, man, you can do so much good if you didn't have so much damn ego. Slide number 11, he says horizontal basically means flat. I'm going to summarize this here so we can move on. When he used this slide and his definition, he's basically using it to show you that the earth ain't flat. Basically what he was saying is that because the earth got mountains and features upon it, that mean it ain't flat. So that's like saying a table is flat. But if you sit a cup on top of it, the table ain't flat no more. The horizon is flat. Once the creator places mountains and trees on top of that horizon, it's no longer flat. Once humans start walking upon that horizon and set his mind, it's no longer flat. A basketball court is flat to set it, except for when people start playing basketball on it. Because set it, explanation was Earth ain't flat because it got features and mountains upon it. So in said his logic, yeah, a basketball court ain't flat because you got people standing on it and bleachers set sitting upon it. A surface is flat no matter what sits upon it. Don't be like said it. I'm trying to save your children for this kind of dumb ass logic and thinking. Don't be so full of your ego you let these kind of people lead you. The shit he's saying, man, you got to be high if you think water flow uphill and you calling yourself intelligent and you can debunk some shit without researching it. That shit make you feel like you Superman. Why the fuck you think this dude got a cape on? But you can't be right if you never be wrong. So you live in a world that can't get right. Since don't nobody want to admit that we wrong, we'll never correct ourselves. We're just going to be full of ego and let people lead our children with dumbass logic that say a table ain't flat once you put your damn cup upon it. Let's move on. So basically, men and women are born from mothers. And our ancestors spoke of a great mother. We speak of earth, we say mother earth, we speak of nature, we say mother nature. So there's a reverence of the mother when we deal with ancient writings and ancient lifestyle and especially cosmology. That mother role was desecrated in the garden when we deal with Eve. Everything I'm telling you now is tying into this slide number 12 that we're dealing with now with Seti because he's giving you sun worship to the left. Now, let me continue building about the great mother as you look at that sun worship to the left. You see, the great mother, just like men and women are born from the woman species, the great mother balances the scales. What do you mean, Brother Sanchez? What's the force and intelligence that keeps the sun and moon on their perfect circuit? It's been done by an intelligent creator. It ain't the result 
of a big bang and a chaotic explosion and a dumbass universe with meteors and rocks and just random mishaps that you never know shit can clash at any time. Yet our days are so carefully planned and night and day is perfect 12 hours and sun and moon is equal size and it's balanced. But we believe the opposite. We believe that the sun is bigger than the earth. This is the backwards mindset of the heliocentric people who blaspheme the, the feminine aspect. The ancestors said that the earth was the mother and you put your seed in her and she feed her children with fruits and plants. Mother nature, Ma'at. Make a long story short, the image to the right is the flat earth model that he mocked, but you can really see the balance in that model. You can see the sun and moon equal sizes, just like the ancestors show. And you can clearly see how day and night is created as the sun and moon performs their circuits above us. There are so many times where you see the sun and moon out at the same time. And if that's true and we're on a globe, then what happens at the bottom of the globe? If I wake up in the morning and go outside and see the sun and moon in the sky, from my location, what are the people at the bottom of the globe looking at? A sky without a sun or a moon? So the fact that we see the sun and moon in the sky at the same time proves that day and night is not caused the way they've been teaching us and that the sun and moon are just as the ancestors say, equal in size with a beautiful circuit pattern above us. That's called balance. Negative, positive. Not one outweighing the other like a big ass sun and a little bitty little blue earth. That's like a damn seesaw to one side. Our ancestors had balance and that's what we perceive in our reality. The sun and the moon is doing 360s above us, but somehow they get 365. And that's how they give you a year based on the dumb ass Gregorian calendar. But SETI, SETI embraces that. He embraces Pope Gregory calendar that tell you it's 365 degrees in a circle. None of y'all don't know y'all real age or what your real birthdays is. You still accepting the calendar that got two Caesars in it, Augustus and Julius, July and August. That's what said he giving y'all with this cosmology. He embracing everything the beast gave us, but said he banging on the beast. So the sun ain't at the center of any of the ancient cosmologies. The great mother sits at the center of all ancient cosmologies. What you don't realize, people, is when you look at Newton Gabe, you're looking at the cosmos. At the center of our cosmos is the North Pole, not the sun. The sun is circling above us with the moon. They're not that big. They're equal in size, and they're beautiful lights that creates a hypnotic effect on us all. They're hiding the mysteries of the stars from us. You think they're giving you the truth and the ancestors giving you the lie? You got to be foolish to trust the deceivers. After thousands of years, them pyramids at Giza still aligning themselves with the same constellations they always align themselves with. How can that be possible if we was on a globe? We will be moved inside of new areas of the universe with new constellations and all of that. But we look up at the same sky the ancestors looked at. That proved that our sky is in motion above us and the earth is stationary. Polaris is called Polaris because it's the pole star. What pole? The North Pole. Why isn't there a pole star for the South Pole? Because there is no South Pole. There's only a South Ring. Why when people cross the equator going south, their compasses don't turn around and point to the magnetic south pole? Think of somebody holding a compass upside down on the bottom of the globe at the south pole. How would that compass work? If all compasses point toward the north pole, imagine somebody at the bottom of a globe holding a compass. Where would a needle point to? The fact that all compasses point to the center of our flat plane to the great mother show you that's where the magnetic energy is. When you say magnetic, the root word of it is ma, M-A, ma. That's the root word of ma'at. 
This is the great mother. Ma'at is the tree of life. That's why her hands is spread. The T is the tree. When you trace an outline of T, you get a triangle or a trinity angel. These three angles form the sacred womb or the vulva, the V, the vortex, the Venus. The man is the penis. But I get into all of the masculine feminine aspects in a lot of my videos. I don't want to deal with that here. But the sun and moon is balanced. And I wish Seti could just see the beauty of our ancestors' cosmology and embrace the truth about his reality and quit denying it. Now let's move on. So slide number 13 by Sarah Suit and Seti. You cannot circumnavigate a flat surface with edges. You can only backtrack your steps. For the sake of not being so redundant and repeat myself a million damn times, I just explained circumnavigation to y'all. Don't make me repeat myself again. Let's move on. Slide number 13. You cannot circumnavigate flat surface with edges. You can only backstep. God damn it. Let me deal with it since he being redundant. Seti. We don't believe in a flat surface with edges. We believe in a flat surface without edges. There is no edges to the earth, according to our ancestors. There are no known edges to it. Okay, so you can't fall off of it because when you do reach any type of barrier, it's a 200 feet ice wall. And when they reach it, they got to fly helicopters off of the ship just to get up on the thing. So you can't fall off the flat earth because ain't no edges to it. We enclosed in a big ass ice wall. But you can fall off of a globe though. Unless you want to talk about falling off of some shit. What's holding the people up under the globe from not falling off? Oh yeah, that theory called gravity. But I just explained a fact called density. Gravity don't exist. Because the globe don't. There's no people up under you walking upside down. Up is up to everybody on earth. The creator ain't no damn unfair, uneven ass creator. Up is up to everyone on earth and down is down to everyone on earth. But that ain't true on a globe. Everybody don't experience the same up on a globe, y'all. But yet we all look up at the same stars, same Polaris. It can only be possible on a flat earth. So again, just because you leave your house and walk around a block don't mean you went over a curve. And I go over this deeper in detail in previous videos, as well as part one when I put that work on SETI. Now let's continue and give him some more of his work. <laughs> Slide number 15 from Sara Suit and SETI. What force keeps people and the objects from falling off the edge? Oh yeah, I don't need to go over this. We already went over gravity. We already explained density. Next slide. Slide number 16. There is no way to achieve gravitational pull without circular motion. So they disregarded gravity in the flat earth theory. Again, I already explained gravity. Yeah, we disregard gravity because it is the theory. The flat earth ain't the theory. That's what said it wrong with his little picture with his truck. The only way you can refute the shit that we saying, which is facts, is with insults. It's detrimental to the generation of our children if we ignore facts and evidence, remain in ignorance, don't teach our children critical thinking, and we just got the kind of children when they face with an obstacle, all they know how to do is make jokes and insults and act like babies. Now, said it's supposed to be the leader and a grown man acting like a damn child. This ain't science. Furthermore, the damn picture he used of flat wheels on a car to support gravity only supports my belief that said it really ain't got them all. Because circular wheels on a car making a car go forward ain't got shit to do with their theory of gravity. A car moving forward ain't got nothing to do with proving no theory called gravity. I would have gave you more props if you would have said, damn, the cost being stuck to the earth, what's holding it down? And drop the microphone like Neil. Then show some square ties to support gravity. The general is really smart, y'all. Everything I gave you in this video to debunk every last one of his slides, that's science. That's critical thinking. 
questions he'll never answer because you can't. You can't. That's why gravity is the damn theory, not flat earth. So, yeah, gravity is disregarded and it's disregarded in your reality. There is no gravity. What the hell existed before gravity? How did the ancestors explain it? I just broke it all down to you. Those of you who really like truth, you will sink it in, research it, replay it, learn it, and you will go free other people's minds like I'm trying to do here with the general. So that completes the whole debunking of y'all damn general. I hope he don't make no more videos and force my hand again. I ain't going to be so nice if he continue on making videos about a subject that he admitted he didn't research on. So if he continue to put bullshit out and nonsense misleading the people with this dumb shit when we trying to question the government why they got this Antarctic Treaty wet they hind and why the hell NASA need $50 million a day to give us these fake-ass pictures of the Earth that said they're using to argue with. Y'all believe this shit real and you get mad at me because I'm telling the truth to the government. But you want to defend the government because you got your damn ego and your money and your lies tied up into they damn lie. Nobody want to go back and correct themselves. So General Seti, I got love for you, man. I just want you to humble yourself because we can't get better if we never be wrong. Seti, you don't know everything, man. You can't keep saying how much you've been around the world and all of this shit what you did like you the only one that done it, brother. You don't know everything. This video proved that. This series proved that. Now, I'm going to give you a minute to let your ass heal. And if you come out with another video, I'm going to take this belt off again. I'm going to lay Seti ass across my lap and I'm going to put this belt on his ass once again. Go and research this shit before you start making more videos, making yourself look dumb. Much love to you, my brother, and much love to all of y'all. If you want to learn more about Flat Earth Truth and you're new to this, please explore my channel. For those of you who subscribe, make sure you still subscribe because YouTube unsubscribe people without them knowing. When you subscribe, click the little bell that's next to the subscription button so it'll let you know when I upload videos and when I go live. Shout out to my family of patrons. I need y'all support to continue this movement. It takes a lot of resources and time. The truth isn't popular. The lies get the most support. I got to keep it real. Shout out to each and every last one of my patrons. Said it. We all learning, it's science, but I'm serious about the truth and what I've proven here should resonate with y'all. Like you really can't argue with these facts and if you can, I would like to hear it. I would like you to correct me. But if you continue to make videos, I will continue to pick them apart meticulously. So with that being said, see y'all on the other side.